very good evening doctors i'm really delighted to welcome you all to the day 2 of best of napcon 21 we are overwhelmed by participation and feedback of the day 1 we are very happy to know that you all have liked it very much on a popular demand we have archived the first episode for your convenient repeat viewing we are very sure that today also you will have a great scientific feast in the form of best of napcon 2021 day 2 today we have a luminaries of faculties discussing very important sub specialty of pulmonology before that let me talk few words about mankind in mankind our vision is to become the most innovative pharmaceutical company which is backed by science and for this vision we are always passionate and agile to the changing needs we see the wind of change blowing across our ecosystem and as mankindian we are proud about initiating one such revolutionary change in quality which we believe will definitely help in our motto of serving life i am referring to the dmf grade global quality product which we have inducted into our product portfolio as a organization we strongly believe that every indian has a equal right to get global quality medicine at affordable price with this thought we have launched this world class usfda approved dmf grade product in our portfolio we wish every indian also to get this benefit of our india's capability as pharmacy of the world the beauty and the challenge in this process is making those superior quality product affordable too good news is that we have already started making this happen we understand this change will be a long process and we are committed to make it happen to know more about dmf please speak to our mankind team coming back to today's event to begin with the day 2 of best of napcon 21 we have dr jk samaria organizing chairman napcon varanasi welcome sir we are proud to have you here now i request dr samaria to commence today's program and to introduce our today's moderator to the audience thank you very much dear friends i welcome you for the second edition of best of napcon 2021 in fact it was great pleasure and privilege for me to host the galaxy of the respective physicians from india and many of them from abroad almost 3 months before at our ancient city of varanasi for napcon 2021 i have very fond memories of the conference and i sincerely hope that our delegates also had good time during their stay in one of the, one of the oldest living city of the world kashi our team also tried to put up a best scientific program for the delegates and i hope that it must have matched their expectations i wholeheartedly congratulate and appreciate the novel initiative of indian chess society through the esprit mankind form of our best of nepal this is very useful idea for those who have attended the nepal and for those who for some reason could not attend it in nepal 2021 i again i once again congratulate and wish all the best for the best of napcon now i welcome today's scientific chair for the best of napcon dr nitin ambankar to take the charge of the rest of the session thank you very much hello and thank you dr samaria for your very kind introduction hi friends welcome you to this very very special program of the best of napcon the basic idea is some of you may have missed the napcon which was a grand success in varanasi this year and i'm sure most of you have seen the first edition which was a brilliant success today we are going to have three talks like last time three different subjects the they are namely radiology interstitial lung diseases and cpd and we will surely have a great academic feast so it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce the first expert dr bhavin jankaria who's a consultant radiologist of picture this by jankaria in mumbai he is also the trustee of the radiology education foundation bhavan has been a prolific radiologist but apart from that 
has penned five books, nearly 35 chapters, and 68 articles, all of them PubMed listed, and has presented nearly 32 posters in various international and national conferences. He's been he has delivered nearly 1500 invited lectures over the last 27 years. He has been the past editor in chief of Indian Journal of Radiology and Imaging between 2007 and 2012, uh, 2007 to 2012. His latest book, 2019, it got published, is Computed Tomography of the interstitial lung diseases. And that's what sort of makes him the special person for this particular. Uh, session. He's also the past president of Indian Radiology and Imaging Association. Uh, uh, he was in 2014. He's also the past president of Indian Musculoskeletal Oncological Society, IMSOS, between 2019 and 2021. And who better than Bhavin to take you through this very, very interesting session on radiology in the best of NAPCON. So over to you, Bhavin. Hi, welcome to uh, Best of NAPCON. Um, my name is Bhavin Jankaria, and uh, today we're going to spend about half an hour looking at three cases. And we have three eminent chest physicians who will be taking these cases and uh, making a diagnosis and then talking about the management. So thank you, uh, Nitin, Dr. Nitin Abhyankar, for the kind introduction. And we will move on to the first case. Uh, this is being taken by Dr. Santa Kumar, who's a pulmonologist at KMCH in uh, Coimbatore. Um, multiple peer-reviewed journal articles, international presentations, Doctor of Excellence at KG Foundation from Dr. Abdul Kalam. He's been a reviewer for multiple journals, has received training in lung transplant at Toronto General and multiple gold medals. So thank you, uh, Dr. Santa Kumar, for joining us and taking this case. And we'll start straight with the case. This is a 70-year-old man with a two years history of progressive breathlessness. Um, and I will run through the cases. Each one of these will have an axial set where we're going from the top to the bottom. And I'm scrolling through the axial set here. Um, just so that we get an understanding, I'll go back from the base to the apex so that you get a little time to see this well. And I'm again going to go back towards the base. And we have a very standard set of findings here. Now we have the coronal set that goes in from the front to the back. And this I will not repeat because I think the axial set was good. And this is these are all the coronal images. And then we have a sagittal set as well that goes from lateral uh, towards the center. Perfect. And then we have the opposite lung as well. So now that we've seen this and you have a fair idea of what is going on, my question is, what is the dominant pattern here? Is it the UIP pattern? Is it the NSIP pattern? Is it an HP pattern? Or is it sarcoidosis? Dr. Santa Kumar, yes, what do you think this is? Yes, sir. First of all, I would uh, like to thank uh, the team and uh, uh, the organizing team and uh, Dr. Bovin uh, for introducing me. So I just uh, 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 the 70 years old man who has come with a breathlessness for two years duration uh, with this CT finding, uh, uh, the CT, the axial and uh, the coronal and sagittal section shown here shows uh, a lot of uh, uh, typical reticulation uh, type of uh, shadows with a lot of interstitial thickening and interstitial septal thickening and all those things. And uh, the uh, distribution is more of a uh, peripheral and uh, the basal predominant uh, distribution with a lot of honeycombing uh, uh, at the bases and the uh, subdural areas. So it's more likely uh, to be a suggestive of a UIP pattern for me. All right. Thank you so much. So, so that is the UIP pattern. We see a reticular abnormality. We see honeycombing uh, here with traction bronchiectasis, we see subplural basal predominance, and more importantly, there's nothing else, no ground glass, no nodules, etc. 
and this becomes our definition of the typical or the classic uh, UIP pattern which we are seeing here. And if you look at the ERS ATS classification, which has been uh, looked at again just about a month ago um, in progressive pulmonary fibrosis, nothing much has changed there too. So we still have the same definition of the typical UIP pattern, which would suggest IPF if there is no other etiology. Honeycombing defines the typical UIP pattern. And so it's important to identify the differentials of honeycombing. On the left here, this is honeycombing. Cysts with shared walls starting in the subplural interstitium and extending up to the um, center. So that's how we define honeycombing. Cysts with shared walls stacked one upon the other. On the right side, this patient has cysts which are communicating going from the hilum to the periphery and this is traction bronch i mean this is bronchiectasis here we have cysts without walls adjacent to the vessel so this is central lobular emphysema these are cysts with walls that are randomly distributed so this is cystic lung disease then these this is paraseptal emphysema these are reparative cysts and this is traction bronchiectasis. So these are the different things we have to keep in mind. And once we get a sense of all of this, we can actually make a diagnosis of honeycombing. And then honeycombing allows us to make a diagnosis of a typical UIP pattern. Now that defines a fibrotic ILD. And whenever we see a diffuse lung disease, our first step is non-fibrotic from fibrotic. And if it is fibrotic, is it IPF or is it chronic HP or sarcoid? Now, this patient had no connective tissue disease, no exposure to allergens, and no other obvious etiology. So in this particular case, the UIP pattern without an etiology becomes idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And I think Dr. Santakumari would agree that it also, the history, the 70-year-old man, all of that fits in too, because if the patient was, let's say, 40 or 50 years old, then we would try and consider other etiologies as well. Yes. Now, yeah, so once we've made the diagnosis, then the next question would be of, you know, further tests and management. And so I will leave that to you for the next four minutes, Dr. Santakumar. Please go ahead and tell us how you would manage this patient. Yes, so I completely agree with uh, Dr. Bowen's uh, uh, description and uh, diagnosis uh, for a typical UIP here. So this 70-year-old man who has come with breathlessness for two years, we have uh, uh, done a CT here, CT shows typical UIP pattern. So uh, uh, it's none other than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the management of uh, this particular patient starts from uh, basically assessing the functional capacity and uh, uh, what is the baseline uh, uh, spirometry and the baseline diffusion capacity and baseline six-minute walk, dis walk distance. All those things has to be assessed. And basically what we are looking for is the, what is the impact of the disease uh, uh, on the patient's uh, uh, quality of life. And uh, being the uh, uh, irreversible damage to the lung, so uh, this almost uh, uh, damages the uh, uh, half of the lung here. Uh, we can see the CT, so the parenchyma involvement is such a significant stage. So we have to assess the uh, functional capacity or the disability status of the patient. So baseline spirometry, baseline DLCO and a six-minute walk distance and baseline echo for a, a pulmonary arterial hypertension assessment, all these things has to be done. Once the uh, assessment is done, then uh, we need to uh, uh, start the patient on medications. The medications may include, uh, uh, the mainstay of medications will include the anti-fibrotic agents like uh, perfilidone or lentinadib. So accordingly, the patients, according to the patient's tolerance level, we can step up on the dose and all those things. And apart from that, supportive medications, including your uh, uh, NSTL cysteines and all those things has to be uh, added. And in particular, in some of the patients, the reflux disease, uh, the gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, symptoms will be much more. So we need to take care of the gastroesophageal reflux uh, component also. And if there are any other comorbid conditions uh, like coronary artery disease or combination, I mean, combined uh, airway symptoms and all those things has to be taken care accordingly. And uh, uh, if the patient comes in uh, with an exacerbation or something like then probably we need to take care of the exacerbation also. 
and uh, uh, the uh, supportive part of the treatment would include uh, uh, the patient's uh, rehabilitation aspect so patient has to be rehabilitated accordingly and uh, oxygen therapy also has to be given accordingly if the patient is hypoxic significantly so this is the outline of management of an ipf uh, patient at the uh, uh, initial level once the treatment is started then probably we need to follow up the patient with the uh, uh, pfts pyrometries and dlcos at least every 6 months and probably we would repeat a ct scan after a year probably uh, to assess the uh, progression of the disease depending on the rapidity of the progression and uh, uh, all those things then probably we may have to think of a, uh, a transplant uh, here being a 70 year old man then transplant uh, option may be uh, uh, having a limited outcome but still we can uh, uh, register this patient for a transplant if the disease progression is very severe and the patient symptomatology is progressing very fast despite maximum medications the patient is not fit enough for transplant then probably we need to continue the supportive care and rehabilitation part uh, to improve the quality of the life at least for the patient to reduce the disability so this uh, uh, comes around the uh, treatment part and just of the this is the just of the outline treatment uh, overall for the this particular patient hey, thank you so much dr sandeep kumar one quick question yes. would you investigate for connective tissue disease in these patients uh, at this age or you it doesn't really matter uh, 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 diagnosing a, a ct shows already a fibrotic uh, uh, lesions and full blown uh, this thing so diagnosing a connective tissue disease even though i mean though it is a very rare uh, incident here so and uh, the it typically shows the uip pattern and uh, i'm not thinking of a connective tissue disease this is here if at all even if you diagnose then it's already a fibrosed lung then probably uh, steroid or an immuno modulant may not be of much helpful here so photo on now perfect so thank you so much and um, i think this went off really well we will move on to case 2 i believe dr chabra is already here so welcome dr chabra and so dr sk chabra is department of pulmonary sleep and critical care medicine at primus Uh, been active in several areas of research uh, senior uh, chest physician one of the top names in india and internationally in asthma copd active in several areas of research former director professor of uh, vallabhbhai patel chest institute and as i said earlier internationally acclaimed so thank you dr chabra for joining us my pleasure and i'll move on to the case we have 10 minutes so yeah. i will uh, run through the case then ask you the question then i will spend some time describing the case and then the last 4 minutes are yours for management yeah so this is a 58 year old man with dyspnea for many years and i'll run through the images again like the first case we have the axial set and i will go through this a little slowly from the top to the bottom and there we go again this pattern is very different from the one that we saw in case one now i'm going back up so we'll spend a little more time on the axial images and i'm going down again so that is the entire set from top to bottom now we look at the coronal images and um, here we are going from the front anterior to the back posterior and i won't repeat this set and this is the sagittal set going from outside or from the lateral aspect towards uh, the midline and i'll speed this up a little bit because we don't need to spend more time on this all right so the question here is dr chabra what do you think is the most likely possibility is it uip nsip organizing pneumonia or hypersensitivity pneumonia uh, well uh, the radiological features are I would say very typical of uh, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. If uh, I go ruling out other diagnoses, then if the lesions are predominantly showing a lot of uh, air trapping. There is upper lobe predominant of interlobular interlobular septal thickening. Uh, it's present diffusely throughout the lung lung substance rather than confined to subpleural. and then there is a ground glass so we are seeing what has been described as a head cheese appearance a typical combination of ground glass specification area of air trapping so 
I mean, the UIP picture is entirely different, NSIP is entirely different. So by exclusion, as well as by a very specific uh, presentation of the three density or a head cheese sign, I would say it's a hypersensitive nephronitis. So that's absolutely perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Chabra. So as, as Dr. Chabra mentioned, we have areas of ground glass, we have areas of lucency. We have the so-called head cheese sign, which is now called the triple density sign. We have an axial distribution going from the hilum to the periphery. Unlike UIP and NSIP, which are predominantly peripheral and often subplural. Um, and we can see here a little bit of fibrosis, which is upper lobe uh, predominant. And you can see that very well here, the fibrosis in the upper lobes, the mosaic kind of pattern in the lower lobe. So when we look at findings of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, we have two or three different patterns. This one is the one we have where we have ground glass, mosaic, air trapping, and cysts. And more importantly, we have the triple density sign, which we're seeing in this patient, where we see three densities. The red arrow is the normal lung. The green arrow is the uh, lucent lung, which on the expiratory images will show air trapping. And all these areas are of ground glass. So three densities, ground glass, lucent, and normal lung uh, typically would imply that we're dealing with a non-IPF etiology. And in most instances, this is suggestive of fibrotic uh, or chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So that's pretty much the diagnosis that we have here. And uh, we come to management. We actually have about six minutes to talk about management. So the floor is all yours, Dr. Chabra. So, uh, so we are discussing management of uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis. Now, hypersensitive pneumonitis has a wide spectrum of presentation. There are some patients who present with a very acute onset of symptoms, and there the radiological picture is entirely different. In fact, it can resemble even miliary tuberculosis, the soft uh, micronodular nodules with upper lobe predominance. In this patient, it's a more of a chronic presentation. So that resembles idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis more in presentation. So that is essentially a fibrotic dominant disease. Hypersensitive pneumonitis as such is a combination of inflammation and fibrotic components. And that is the more recent classification. The patients who present acutely, there the management is based on anti-inflammatory medication, that is corticosteroids. And the response is generally very good in acute hypersensitive pneumonitis. And in about two to three months, most of these patients show a very good recovery. In fact, hypersensitive pneumonitis is one of the two or three interstitial lung diseases which show a favorable response to treatment, the other being sarcoidosis. When the presentation is more chronic, like in this patient, then long-term management with corticosteroids, that is the standard and the most effective management. Some patients may not respond very well. We have the option of adding a second anti-immunomodulator, which has a steroid sparing effect. And the one which is favored now is mycophenolate. There were a time when we used to give azathioprine after the response to steroids had been evaluated and it was not looking too good. So some patients would be on a combination of corticosteroids and mycophenia. In some patients, the disease can progress in about 25%. So it becomes a progressive pulmonary fibrosis. There, if it is documented that CT is showing worsening of the fibrosis and the lung function is going down, the FVC is going down or different capacity is going down and patient is worsening clinically, then antifibrotics have not been approved as the add-on to retard the progress of fibrosis. So depending on presentation and the dominance of the lesions, steroids, combination with mycophenolate, and in a disease which has started developing progressive fibrosis, antifibrotics have a role. So... Dr. Chabra, would you do a hypersensitivity pneumonitis antigen panel? Because we see quite a few physicians asking for these and there are some who say that they are of no use and there are some who swear by them. So where do you stand and 
what is your thought on this so i didn't uh, something wrong can you please repeat i said do you do an hp antigen panel in such patients do you believe in those results or they are not very useful uh i have not found this panel of antigens very useful firstly in patients who are typical hp some very often we get a negative result and then we also get positive result in patients who are not apparently hp so it lacks specificity as well as sensitivity so generally i don't go by this panel i make my diagnosis on clinical presentation and most importantly on ct like this kind of picture i don't even require a biopsy so typical of hp sure. of course there are some patients where the radiological features are often overlapping with idiopathic polyp fibrosis and there an open lung biopsy or a vat assisted biopsy is required but when the picture is typical then beyond a ct a good ct uh, i don't think we require any other aid of course lung function testing is required and how about um, uh, how i mean do you actively uh, try and get the patient to avoid the antigenic stimulus especially if it is pigeon related would you tell them not to you know try and move their house i know it's very difficult but how do you manage the antigenic stimulus uh, ongoing antigenic stimulus well there are some patients who present acutely their uh, sometimes history is rewarding good history is rewarding and uh, exposure to damp places in the house or where construction is going on lot of soil exposure so which would lead to some kind of organic exposure so in acute presentation history is important but and there one can advise avoidance and avoidance is a very effective management strategy patients who present with chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis there the history is not very helpful the reason is that the process has been going on for years and it's a effect of cumulative exposure so there the presentation is very much like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis with dry cough and exertional dyspnea and in any case once the fibrosis has set in and especially when it is progressive fibrosis then avoidance is not really going to help if we can definitely at any stage avoidance is useful but it's more useful in acute presentations than chronic thank you so much dr chhabra this was a great case and um, i'm sure all the participants have learned a lot about chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis we move on now to the third case and we have dr ankit bansal uh, to to take the case he's a consultant uh, chest physician at fortis escorts hospital in jaipur designated as fellow by accp part of many um, international national societies and expert on interventional procedures and part of the vats team um, also versed with allergy asthma ild diagnosis etc so the third case that we are going to look at In, and we're looking at younger and younger patients we went from 70 to a fifth, mid 50s and now we have a 38 year old with short history of 3 uh, uh, months with dyspnea and again like with those three cases i'm going to run through the axial images and we'll get from the top to the bottom and i'll go a little slow but i'm going to again go back up so that um, we can have a good look and spend some time on seeing the case clearly this is very different from the first two cases and um, that should help us see the spectrum of diseases that we see with interstitial or diffuse lung diseases now we'll see the coronal from anterior to posterior in this particular case the coronal images are extremely useful and then we have the lateral set here from lateral uh, from outside to inside and this is the question what is the pattern of disease is it silicosis is it miliary tuberculosis is it hypersensitivity pneumonitis or is it sarcoid ankit all uh, yours uh, thank you sir for your kind introduction and i would like to thank ics for making me a part of this uh, academic discussion 
uh, considering the CT images of a 35 year old male, you can very well appreciate it. There are small nodules which have possibly a uh, perilipatic distribution, maybe peribronchovascular distribution. We can also see some uh, subpleural interlobal septal nodules also. And predominantly, these nodules, if we see uh, all the three sections in total, we will find mostly they are in uh, to the towards the upper lobe. So, um, uh, considering uh, yes, history is very important uh, in this particular case, uh, but uh, maybe uh, more towards uh, sarcoidosis, uh, the case is going towards that. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bansal. That was uh, that's absolutely the right diagnosis. Now, when we look at this, I think the first thing that strikes us that is that we're dealing with nodules, and I I think that differentiation we need to make. The first case was a fibrotic ILD that was UIP IPF. The second, we had ground glass with a mosaic pattern with some fibrosis, but very different. And here we have a non-fibrotic ILD where the predominant pattern is that of nodules. And when we get nodules, we do look at them as ill-defined and discrete. Ill-defined, diffuse, as Dr. Chabra had mentioned, you get those micronodular, centrilobular nodules, you get them with hypersensitivity, pneumonitis. And discrete nodules, if they're perihylar, subplural, septal, perivascular, as in our case, then that's sarcoidosis. If you have two to three millimeter size, you get them in miliary, tree and bud is TB and random confluent would be silicosis. So here are those ill-defined uh, confluent centrilobular nodules typical of inflammatory uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Here we have the, another case with these perivascular and fissural nodules that we would see with sarcoid. Here we have these two to three millimeter sized nodules randomly distributed and this is typical of miliary TB and here we have a patient with eggshell nodal calcification a mass which is of progressive massive fibrosis and these nodules which are of different sizes and becoming confluent in a couple of areas and this is typical of silicosis so the diagnosis is sarcoid Sarcoid is still uh, classified as per the scadding criteria and stage zero is normal. Stage one is bilateral hyalur adenopathy. Two is lymph nodes with lung. Three is only lung. And four is advanced fibrosis. So this is stage one, non-necrotic subcarinal hyalur adenopathy. Stage two, where we have lung lesions with lymphadenopathy. Stage three, where we have only lung lesions, no nodes. And stage four, where we now have fibrosis with volume loss along with the nodule. So that's chronic pulmonary sarcoid. We can often see patients moving from stage to stage. So here you have a stage two disease, normal lungs, a non-necrotic lymphadenopathy. The lymph nodes have regressed, but now nodules have come up. So the patient has moved to stage three. So our patient has both lymph nodes as well as uh, lung lesions. And so that was stage three. And we come to management. We have five minutes, uh, Ankit, and so the floor is all yours. Please tell us how you would manage this patient. Uh, management of uh, sarcoidosis is a very important key because at least 5% of die because due to any kind of pulmonary or cardiac involvement. Since we know that sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease, predominantly involving your lungs, it can involve cardiac, uh, neurological involvement could be there and eye involvement could be there. With other uh, systems involvement could be there, there are certain entities which are defined like sarcoidosis associated fatigue or small fiber neuropathy. Now treating the patients with sarcoidosis basically depends upon what is the major involvement, what is the high risk of future mortality to these type of patients and what are the possibilities of permanent disabilities to the patient. So the management closely lie to case to case basis, but in general, those patients who are asymptomatic and preserving their lung function, you can closely observe these patients uh, without treatment. But again, you have to see high risk patient and possibility of disabilities in these patients. So you have to closely observe this patient, any patient who is symptomatic and uh, possibilities of disabilities or in the further stages. <coughs> 
three, four, particularly uh, as for the steady criteria, if we see radiologically, then oral glucocorticoids remain the first mainstay of treatment. Those patients who are not responding to that oral glucocorticoids or having a uh, side effects related to it and disease progression despite on glucocorticoids can be given the option of alternative immunosuppression. The alternative immunosuppression, which can be possibly uh, uh, offered to these patients, may be in form of methotrexate. Uh, mycophenolate has been chosen in some of those patients. Azathioprine is one of those options which can be tried out in this group of patients. Besides this, anti-TNF therapies like infliximab has been also given in certain group of patients who are resistant to the primary one. So, this is an important prospect that we have to see, particularly if there is cardiac sarcoidosis, the role of antiarrhythmics, diuretic, besides the primary treatment is also very important. Sometimes there is need of implantable cardio, water defibrillator is required, ICD placement could be required in those sort of patients. Neurosarcoidosis again has to be uh, managed uh, with maybe high dose or pulse steroids. So these are the various treatment options available to those set of patients. But in advanced cases, maybe we have to assess those patients if they are the candidates for uh, lung transplant or maybe lung or cardiac transplant both. So these patients can be assessed for that also. Thank you. Dr. Bansal, when would you biopsy these patients to come to a diagnosis? Are there uh, typical features where you would treat on the basis of the clinical features and the CT scan versus uh, there are, are there specific situations where you would do either a nodal biopsy with EBUS or CT guided or EUS or a lung biopsy transbronchial? How would you decide that? Uh, uh, particularly if there are certain cutaneous uh, lesion like uh, what we call as Lofgren syndrome or lupus perineum, possibly you need to need not to uh, biopsy those patients. You can offer them the treatment. But any patient who have uh, who is symptomatic uh, with uh, deranged lung function test, uh, they can be offered the biopsy. Biopsy the choice. Preferably would be EBUS uh, with uh, possibly sampling of your mediastinal load along with taking sampling of the lung biopsy in terms of transbronchial lung biopsy can also be performed in those set of patients. Would you do it in every patient? But if it was typical lung uh, lesions like this patient, would you biopsy or would you accept the diagnosis and start treatment? There is always a possibility of alternative diagnosis. So possibly I'll start in this particular uh, patient with my confirmed diagnosis. He is already in stage three, possibly symptomatic also. So I'll biopsy this patient and try to confirm it and then start the treatment. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bansal. And um, thank you, everyone. I think we've had a great time. We've looked at three cases We've looked at a different spectrum, starting with a fibrotic ILD, a UIP, IPF, then a chronic HP, which was partly fibrotic, partly non-fibrotic, and then we've moved to a non-fibrotic sarcoid. And these three, apart from connective tissue disease, ILD would be the four common patterns of diffuse lung diseases that we see in practice in India. I'd like to um, thank the organizers, thank mankind and all the panelists and everyone else who's uh, allowed us to do this um, uh, panel and this session. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Bavin, for excellent expert moderation of your session. Now, COPD has been one of the most difficult challenges that a pulmonologist faced. And to take us through that, I'm inviting Dr. Rajesh Swarnakar. He's the director and chief consultant pulmonologist, uh, Department of Respiratory and Critical and Sleep and Interventional Pulmonology in Get Well. Hospital and Research Institute, Nagpur. 
and uh, all of us very very fondly know him as the national secretary of indian chess society the moment you say the word ics rajesh is always remembered because he's been so active and is brought ics to a new glory as we have seen he has 36 national and international publications contributed two chapters in respiratory medicine book he is a university pg guide he is also an md and a dnb examiner he is a national board member of lung india he is the principal of academy of clinical research training he is director of unique clinical research private limited president of getwell sanjivani education society advisor to the government of india in matters of national health policy and planning an expert for making guide indian guidelines in spirometry nebulization basic bronchoscopy and adult vaccination so as you can see is one of the most uh, worthy uh, experts when we are discussing copd a topic which is very close to pulmonary heart and at the same time we are seeking answers to the most difficult COPDs that we that we encounter in our daily practice. So, with that, over to Dr. Rajesh Varnakar to introduce his panel. Thank you, Dr. Nitin, for your kind introduction and a warm welcome, dear audience, to this panel discussion on COPD and best of NAPCON Day Two. So, as Dr. Nitin has already alluded. the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is the third leading cause of death worldwide causing 3.23 million deaths in 2019 alone nearly 90% of copd deaths occur under 70 years of age and it is there in low and middle income countries more often so there is high prevalence of copd in india among adults and it is number 2 killer in our country after cardiac causes but we indeed need to have a nation wide community based survey to estimate the true burden of copd using robust and uniform methodology this would be useful for planning and implementation of community based control measures and also for the monitoring and evaluation evaluation so copd causes persistent and progressive respiratory symptoms as we all know including difficulty in breathing cough and phlegm production a copd results from long term exposure to harmful gases and particles combined with individual factors apart from the tobacco uh, smoke uh, including events which influence lung growth in childhood and also genetics which can cause uh, early copd so environmental exposure to tobacco smoke indoor air pollution occupational dust fumes and chemicals are important risk factors for copd early diagnosis and treatment including smoking cessation support is needed to slow the progression of symptoms and reduce the flare ups so there are various phenotypes that has been identified for copd like predominant emphysema chronic bronchitis the asthma copd overlap the frequent exacerbators and there is need to identify identify these treatable threats to optimize the treatment in individual copd patients with this context in mind let us discuss a few case scenarios pulled out from our daily clinical practice and discuss their management with our panel of experts and we are privileged to have an esteemed panel of experts among us to discuss each case scenario and other issues to draw clinically relevant conclusions so let's have an introduction of our panel so we have my dear friend dr agam bora who is a chess physician and in charge of vora clinic at borivali west mumbai he is an honorary consultant in chess physician at karuna hospital and also suchak hospital mumbai he is secretary general of association of physicians of india for the year 2022 to 25 he 
He is assistant editor of Journal of Association of Physicians of India, that is JAPI Journal. He is also member of editorial board of Chest Indian Edition. We also welcome another dynamic expert among us, that is Avya Bansal, who is from Bombay Hospital, Mumbai. He is there as a consultant chest physician and is also honorary chest physician to Apli Mumbai Police at Univers and also he is also a university topper in his MD. And the stalwarts among the panelists is Dr. Animesh Arya, unit head and senior consultant in respiratory medicine at Sri Balaji Action Medical Institute, New Delhi. Welcome to you all once again. So let me share the first clinical scenario that we are going to discuss and that will be the case one and uh, I think I would request uh, Dr. Agam to initiate the discussion on this and this is a case of a 61 year old male who presented at emergency with complaints of nocturnal and early morning shortness of breath, cough and expectoration and wheezing episode for past two weeks. He gave history of similar episodes for the past six, seven years. There is no history of breathlessness in childhood, but patient was diagnosed with COPD six, six years back. There is a history of a progressive worsening of exertional dyspnea, seasonal variation of breathlessness with symptoms on exposure to dust. And it was more during cold climate that often need hospitalization. And this has been happening since last six to seven years. He does give history of biomass fuel exposure since childhood and which might be the cause for his emphysema. He is otherwise a non-smoker, non-alcoholic and there is no history of tuberculosis in past and the family. If I tell you about the spirometry, it shows FEV1 is 57%. The post bronchodilator FEV1 is 69%. FEV1 by FEC is 59%, post bronchodilator FEV1 by FEC is 61%, and there is a post bronchodilator increase in FEV1 by about 20%. Incidentally, the peripheral eosinophilia was also present in the absolute eosinophil count, it's 766. So, over to you, Agam, that how to approach this case if this case comes to you in your clinic. Rajesh Bhai, this is really very interesting uh, case and something that we see in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, at, the outset, uh, at the outset, I must thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here. And uh, thanks to my friends, uh, Mankind, for bringing about this best of NAPCON for all those who could not attend physically. Uh, the case is about an elderly male, 61 years, who's non-smoker and who gives some history of uh, atopy in past, some history suggestive of maybe uh, uh, asthma as well. And I think this would fit classically to my mind as asthma COPD overlap. Though we may not like to use this term, there may be a lot of confusion regarding use of this term, but I would say this is mainly COPD with asthma features. And uh, there is a, a presence of peripheral eosinophilia in the sense if you're asking me from the diagnosis point of view, my, my in my mind in the matrix that i have for uh, uh, you know copd evaluation i would have it in the c category of uh, that matrix or if in other words i have to tell you it is copd with some reversibility copd with some kind of asthma or phenotype and the only implication it will have from treatment point of view would be that this patient may be the candidate for inhaled corticosteroid as well with a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, understanding, which which prevents us from using steroids routinely in COPD patients. So that has been a sea change in my understanding for COPD patients, where I've almost stopped using uh, inhaled steroids in COPD, but this is one peculiar situation. So there are only two situations to my mind where I would use steroid in COPD patients. One is the case scenario like this, where there is some peripheral eosinophilia. If I get chance to look at sputum eosinophilia, or whenever there is asthma phenotype. So that is one category of patient. And second category of patient is somebody who gets multiple exacerbations. So I think only in these two situations, I would be tempted to use steroid if that has got, uh, uh, you know, uh, Animesh Bhai, if you want to add something to what I said. Now, so usually we, we are the chest physician, only deal with patients who are in B and D category mostly. So uh, this is what is of course the scenario. 
and of course this is echo is of course one of uh, one of the condition in which we do use ics uh, as as a first line therapy in fact so there is no need to first use lava lama and then you jump to ics as we do in absolute group d but here there is an indication in which uh, we can use uh, ics uh, this thing so what would be the criteria for echo uh, if you ask me yes the echo would be a mixed kind of picture so you have a, a, a classical uh, copd patient on one hand and you have classical asthma patient on one hand so you have a young patient with history of atopy with eosinophilia there with elevated ig with maybe skin uh, ocular and asthma presentations you have a classical spirometry which shows good reversibility i think i would put them into asthma basket on the other end if you have a patient who is in probably 50s or 60s though we have a concept of now early copd as well but if you're looking at somebody who's 50 60 and who's been smoking for like say uh, uh, 10 years 20 years who's been smoking about a pack of cigarette a day and this patient has got spirometry which is suggestive of obstructive pattern with fev even not showing improvement post bronchodilator i think that is my classical case of copd but the case that you you kind of narrated where there is some amount of family history of asthma when there is some atopy there where is some peripheral eosinophilia absolute eosinophil count is above 500 and this patient does not have full reversibility on spirometry may show some improvement in lung function some improvement in fev even following a bronchodilator maybe i would put them into all asthma copd overlap uh, basket the only uh, clinical implication this patients will have is this patient disease behavior would be different they would suffer more they would be more symptomatic they may have more exacerbations and for us to understand identify this population and put them on steroid in the relatively earlier phase of uh, the disease progress would be worthwhile thank you yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah uh, thank you uh, super thank you mankind for inviting me to join the uh, the uh, large group here and thank you dr rajesh anagam and uh, really interesting case and uh, really a great teaser i would say uh, for a common person to actually deal with because uh, uh, there is going to be really a big overlap uh, in understanding unless you go back to the history and if you affront uh, start actually looking at uh, one point of contact then there will be a lot of confusion so only thing which would guide us would be the presence of eosinophilia and a swing in uh, Uh, you know the perspective or the symptoms of the patient vis-a-vis exacerbations and during that whether he is responsive to oral steroids or not so but if he is more exacerbator with copd like features like a smoker here then he would definitely be more prone to exacerbation requiring oral steroids and follow up with a, a triple drug combination and inhaled steroids on a longer term basis whether it's a single inhaler or a multiple inhaler that's a different story and uh, uh, second would be uh, basically how actually uh, it may be still difficult for us also to decide but what meets these uh, the fate of these patients in terms of a actually a real world practitioner because the diagnosis is never going to be clear to him and as uh, agam pointed out there would be actually a pendulum swing between true asthma and copd and uh, uh, so the label to carry forward in true sense so whenever this kind of patient actually go from doctor to doctor they would should be treated on the same lines rather than actually uh, you know getting off inhale corticosteroids after they get exacerbation thinking that they are not asthma pure and again you know uh, if uh, thinking that they are pure asthma continuing of ics for a long period of time particularly as per the guidelines if the eosinophil counts get below 300 yeah. then there is case for withdrawal of steroids as well so that is i would like to add so in which of the cases you would give ics because there is also in gold cubity they have told when to give ics even otherwise and also when when also not to give so there is so if there is a what to call sort of fear about infection happening because of ics what is your take on that i mean and and then also once you have started ics how long how long you will be just giving this ics uh, in these in these patients so i would like to start actually on a reverse mode Uh, if you see the gold guidelines where the evidence is against it so at least we know for absolute contraindications 
particularly if there is a mycobacterium tuberculosis or suspicion of reexacerbation or actually you know reinfection with tuberculosis then inhaled corticosteroids are absolutely no number one and if the eosinophil count in a stable copd with mild exacerbation which i think if you are asking me is less than 100 then definitely yeah. we would not like to give steroid so because if you are clear about the no then we would be more you know justified and uh, i can say less afraid of using inhaled corticosteroids in other group of patients and uh, particularly patients who have had uh, actually pneumonia in past so again uh, i think uh, rajesh and agam would agree it is such a big uh, a chunk of evidence for it and chunk of evidence against it whether ics make you more prone to pneumonia versus exacerbation prevention which could be mnemonic or lrti and whether to consider that as pneumonia so that is a big uh, you know difference so barring that i think all the criteria if they are uh, uh, fulfilled as uh, pointed out by the gold guidelines if you want uh, being you know uh, the about 50% plus and uh, ics uh, eosinophil count uh, more than uh, actually 100 or up to 300 and uh, frequent exacerbators uh, definitely like to add steroids and you know so you would like to stop steroids once he has improved or if he is not yes. improving or and then again you you and then you'll again go back or for the follow up to see whether he is improving or not so how long so one thing is for certain persons who are hospitalized with the severe exacerbations again so the negative would become positive if they are severely exacerbating needing hospitalization would definitely be continued on inhaled steroid corticosteroids for at least 6 weeks to see whether they uh, actually are getting back into the exacerbation or not again so that is one thing yes. and whether it's a triple drug or you know or a, uh, a single drug because most of them are on long acting uh, or short acting sorry short acting bronchodilators and inhaled corticosteroid during hospitalization as well as ocs so that is one case in point and uh, as they improve and if uh, they can be managed on a little uh, mild to moderate doses yeah. of steroids i think uh, then there is a case for withdrawal of steroids again whether eosinophil count which is the challenge for us to actually believe truly whether we can really go down below 100 to see in okay. real practice and then start withdrawing that is again a very you know conceptually challenging and absorbing thing but we will definitely like to withdraw steroids after 6 weeks if he is stable and i want to i want to add uh, something uh, here uh, you know for the benefit of the first time in the in the guidelines there is a concept of withdrawal of medicine when it comes to copd because traditionally we realized that copd is a progressive disease and you have to keep on adding so we were ta- taught earlier to start with one drug make two drug make three drug but there was no concept of stepping down stepping mm-hmm. down was always possible in asthma but friends for the first time this guideline which is talking about removing inhaled corticosteroid provided your patient stabilized so if you have used in category c category c is classically when you have eosinophilia classically when you have some reversibility when you have a asthma copd overlap kind you don't discontinue steroid but in category d patient when you have had exacerbation when you have used steroids probably once the exacerbation settles you give adequate trial of removing this steroids and in some situations you will be successfully able to do so and there is a there is a thought block there is a perception block in mind we, we believe that we cannot step down but trust me last one and a half two years we have realized that we are in the position of stepping down and putting them on two bronchodilators that is laba and lama combination thank you yeah. yes yeah so okay. seeing, yeah animesh yeah this, uh, perfectly agree with that yeah so i think uh, we have quite also discussed this case adequately uh, just um, and if we move away from this case uh, this gold 2022 has got some of the terms that has really come up uh, quite uh, quite quite a newly early copd then there is also mild copd copd in young young also people and then we also pre and then we also pre copd so there is what you call a lot of confusion in this so can you just tell me what about uh, 
proper this comes miles you pretty i mean that's that's, that's, that's a very it. interesting uh, concept you know it's it's life taking one full circle we started with the concept of uh, you know miles you pretty and some of in the line the term was uh, abandoned mm-hmm. and yes. uh, we realized that you pretty is one common disease which is worldwide with significant morbidity and mortality trust me 2015 data when i was looking at 3 million people dying every year third leading cause of death and if i make very rough calculations like i have a habit of making you have almost five deaths every minute occurring in the world because of copd it is a time to revise our knowledge on copd and look at what more can be done and when when we are looking at this we realize that there may be a concept of identifying patients in um, in their early phase so that is what is early copd and mild copd is patients who are mildly symptomatic so these are two different terminology many times we confuse we believe mild would be early it is not so there are different phenotypes and you will realize in time mild may remain mild for a long time and early may progress to mild to moderate to severe so these are the two concept and early may be looked upon at very early where i may even look at it as you know there may be factors which are responsible in even the prenatal life you may be surprised to understand the concept as looking at there may be risk factors which are prenatal like your maternal smoking your family history of copd some genetic factors which we are yet to understand malnutrition etc playing role there may be perinatal factors again the perinatal smoking there may be a low uh, birth weight there may be uh, exposure to pollution at very early age maybe indoor uh, uh, smoking or maybe indoor uh, rest of the pollutants etc playing role so these factors would lead to probably understanding of something called as early copd so it is early copd is mainly looked upon into two terms it may be a biological early it yeah. may be clinical early so most of these patients may may not have any manifestation your patient may not complain about cough at all may not have shortness of breath at all but this may be a beginning of copd and that is the time if we can develop some modules some understanding of picking up we may be able to reduce the kind of mortality we have in our country so early may be related to overall mechanisms which are responsible there may be certain biomarkers which we realize over time we would gain understanding there may be role of early scans or early ct scan where you may be able to pick up the the bronchiolar level abnormalities or the alveolar level abnormalities and you may identify this patient as probably early copd and close watch on them may may probably be able to to change the disease course and mild on the other hand when you have symptoms there and when these patients are uh, subjected to spirometry so you must have the clinical syndrome three symptoms like your cough chest tightness and sputum production so when you have this three cardinal symptoms in presence of any risk factor which i mentioned about which may be indoor or outdoor pollution which may be smoking which may be perinatal factors which may be early uh, you know exposure to or, or early infections in the life etc when you have this subject them to spirometry when you subject them to spirometry and you realize that there may be fev1 by fec which is less than 0.7 a hallmark of obstruction and your fec which is not reduced your fec may be 80 i mean sorry fev1 your fev1 may be 80 so that means this patients are not really symptomatic much and they have a spirometric evidence of obstruction that may be mild copd so that is my understanding of mild and uh, early copd i mean you may you may correct me if i'm wrong you may add something if you feel i missed yeah 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 not also so you have alluded very well the point of uh, the point of debate is if you have just started them early would you start some treatment for them there is no no it not really. yeah so even if i identify them, them we just have to, we just have to, to observe, observe them Yeah. critically and have to be very vigilant about their lifestyle changes you yeah. would definitely advise them to prevent whatever are the modifiable factors around them and and preserve their lung function i would be very vigilant i would probably subject them to earlier spirometries maybe and uh, uh, probably uh, we are yet to gain knowledge on it i mean these are just newer terms which are yeah, as newer term exciting terms five years after five years when you are doing best of the napcon 2030 or 2028 that time we would discuss this in detail <laughs> So it is a an oscillometry also picks the very early. So maybe oscillometry would also evolve. Yes. At that time, because these are the tools in which you can. You were told earlier correct, than correct. Correct. Even DLCO, DLCO yeah, is also yeah. probably considered as an earlier tool yeah. for yeah. understanding, uh, you know, the early COPDs. Of course, it may have lot of. Uh, it it needs to be interpreted in the right clinical context, but DLCO may have a role in early picking up of COPD. Yes, Doctor Anmesh, you want to add something, or shall we move to the case number two? 
So I think the picture is set in very early, or the scenario is set in one earlier in the early COPD onset, particularly in lower socio-economic strata in our country. So because of uh, maternal smoking, indoor pollution, living in very shanty, you know, jogis and shanty dwellings, and uh, then lower birth weight, and as uh, Agam pointed out, you know, perinatal and intranatal factors. So that has to be recognized in a larger you know, scale by the mm. authorities and the government to actually prevent the COPD going into that kind of thing. Because these people, when they grow into adulthood, if they are smoking, they tend to have an earlier age-wise onset of COPD than other people. They would be having symptoms as early as maybe 28 years or 30 years. And they would have a COPD by 35 years and mortality by 40, 40 to 45 years. And majority of them could be women who are actually indoors you know, subjected to biomass fuel exposure as well. And if they are smoky on top of that, so we must have more and more clinical tools because these people cannot be subjected to, you know, spirometry very easily. Or maybe, a, you know, a FV6 measurement may help in these patients on a mass scale because we do have a spirometer which can measure the FV6 and an early phase. If we can pick up the COPD, we can make really changes in their life and improve the quality of life and decrease the burden of COPD as a whole in the community. So that's important. And two different two different uh, classical presentations that we have in our country is one is uh, uh, this, you know, your post tuberculous uh, uh, COPD behavior, which is which is something very unique. And uh, the early the young COPD that we are seeing, what Sir was talking about, that you know, classically when I was a student, I was told 50 ke pehle COPD soch ne ne. You know, 50 plus is COPD and now I realize 30 to 50, there is a huge, ah. huge chunk of COPD. So these two COPDs are very peculiar to our country and I think it, we would need to understand them better. Yeah, so I think we have covered most of these definitions and you have alluded it also very well. Uh, shall we go to the case number two and uh, this is for Dr. Animesh RA to answer. So. This is again a patient of 67 year old COPD patient who is on two drugs, Laba, Lama, as we start. And if he's having this persistent dyspnea and frequent exacerbation, what are the options that you would add to it apart from ICs that we already said and we already alluded to it? That of course we'll if we use this Laba, Lama, this thing ICs. Do you, I mean, add just something else to this? So, uh, that's very good. Uh, so basically, uh, this patient will like to revisit, uh, you know, the whole history and then see uh, what are the pointers, why the person having exacerbation and a frequent dyspnea. So we can start with patient uh, basically assessing uh, what lava lama combination is he taking, and if he is taking, let's say, uh, formiterol and uh, diatropia, we can switch over to a you know, longer acting, more potent uh, uh, valentrol and indicatrol combination because which are at least more affinity for beta 2 receptor and we have seen in certain trials that the clinical, uh, uh, actually uh, the surrogate markers like FEV1 and the end uh, 23 and a half hour or next dose, tough FEV1 is much better with these agents than the conventional formiterol and, you know, a diatropium. So that would be one thing. But before that, even we would like to understand whether these people are taking their inhalers in a yeah, current plan. Yeah, that's important. Whether they are the device and the hand to device coordination is important because unless we improve upon that, we may be totally failing to understand the cause of his exacerbation and persistence of symptoms. Because 67 patient person the age, he may be having a you know difficulty in dexterity. Of use, he may be having difficulty in hand to mouth coordination, he may be arthritic, he may be you know senile tremors. So, we may shift to a spacer device, or if he's still not able to do that, we can ask one of the family members to use the spacer device with him. And if he's able to afford a nebulization, because the moment we add nebulization to these patients. The cost jumps nearly 24 because the nebulization with, you know, formitrol and inhaled corticosteroids is prohibitively expensive. It's very, very difficult to afford. And that increases the chance of oral fungus. So I think first is the correctness of the technique should be re-emphasized. Patient should be reviewed within two weeks of time if it is not too bad. Whether it is improved upon that, 
and whether there is change in his walk distance and the subjective feeling of sickness because f even may not be too uh, early to improve the only thing we can see is the probably some improvement in the mrc scale the 6 minute walk distance and the subjective feeling of distance so that is one thing before we jump on to thinking that he could be a frequent exercise better and uh, going on to the b category where uh, he would require inhaled corticosteroids and then whether he is continuing to smoke or not if he is continuing to smoke the whole thing falls flat because he is not going to improve at all in whatever we may do whether we may add inhaled corticosteroids or he may then require additional burden of oral corticosteroids and then the recent studies i read will show the patient having certain comorbidities like you know left ventricular dysfunction anemia osteoporosis rheumatoid arthritis these patients are more prone to exacerbations and they are more prone to severe exacerbation with severe debility so unless we correct these kind of things uh, we may be just you know adding ics without a much improvement in his bronchodilatation with inhaled uh, lava and lava cough so that would be first thing and then i would go on to assess whether he has eosinophilia and how much exacerbations he has had as he had previous hospitalization the like we discussed in the previous so that would be my thing so what if i know this phosphodiester inhibitor do you use this phosphodiester inhibitors because it came it came with the bang but i don't see much of them now in uh, now being used and azithromycin and nsilcystin uh, on suppose he has got what you call severe exacerbation even after ics it is lava lama combination so what are your options and what do you give to these patients among these uh, among these drugs that are available jo phosphodiester is liberation like rofloglas uh, we have used what 5 to 6 years back with a lot of uh, patients yeah, but yeah they are not being used now but because no. of their side mm-hmm. effects yeah. was uh, they used to cause severe uh, uh in our loss of weight so a lot of my patients began actually you would say they lose uh, not uh, in six months time about 6 to 7 kg of weight and if a person of copd nature who's challenge and one end we are talking of copd and cachexia and then he did put cachexia by making him with loose muscle mass and whether it adds on to uh, the benefit derived by phosphodiesterases inhibitors and whether it is persistent that is you know debatable so and as such the availability has gone down so if there is a very subset of phenotype an obese patient whose uh, lung function is very very you know restricted leading to a severe obstruction i would still want to use if it is available and a choice much earlier than inhaled corticosteroids and uh, then see whether he improves or not number 1 and uh, second long term azithromycin i think uh, it's a very difficult option to carry on with the patient actually to make him believe that he has to take a like you know antibiotic for one year and, uh, and the doses have been very confusing if you write 500 once a day or even if you write 500 alternate day the patient through its chemist would invariably drop it down to 250 mg after two weeks time and then would discontinue beyond a month so that is not practical and it cannot be followed up so i would rather increase my inhaled corticosteroids or add on and uh, improve on maybe nebulization of uh, you know uh, uh, ultra lamas and ultra lavas than use azithromycin then you would also like to also rule out mot in cases of this if you are using azithromycin you should rule out this or mot yes. cases also mycobacterium rather than tuberculosis that is another thing and then and then also issue was resistance uh, which can be developed in this yeah. and acidal cystin do you do you do you we were routinely used there are no combinations uh, of these drugs available uh, favorites and uh, uh, only thing it derives the benefit that it is Uh, probably not as a mucolytic, uh, uh, but probably as a, an, a uh, you know uh, antioxidant or a free radical scavenger. In a case uh, where we see more of emphysema than uh, predominantly as a patient who is you know chronic bronchitic phenotype, which has probably proven a long term benefit. So there, I would like to use at least for post exacerbation for some time. Whether to use on a long term. again it is uh, 
if the patient is stable, unlikely to use on a long term basis. Right. So, because of short of time, we'll move to the uh, uh, third case. Agam, if you don't have to add something else to this. So, I think, friends, at this point, I would bring Dr. Avya Bansal for the case number three, as we have actually discussed uh, the what role of uh, all these drugs, LABA, LAMA, now ICS, triple drug combination. We have talked also about pulmonary rehabilitation, NIV, oxygen. Now I've got a case in which the patient has taken all this, all these things, and yet when I just see a CT of his, I see that he's got advanced COPD in the sense that he has got predominant emphysema and also severe hyperinflation. So apart from this pharmacological lung volume reduction that 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 we can achieve by drugs, do we have something else in the IP that can help this patient, Dr. Avya? Uh, sir, at the onset, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity at this forum and asking me this question. It's indeed an honor to share a dice with you and all the esteemed speakers. Uh, like you very rightly put across a question which is uh, glaring at all of us, that what more can we offer to our COPD patients with a severe emphysema and hyperinflation? Now, like we see in the CT scan, if it's a predominantly upper lobe emphysema, what is important for us is to determine the exercise tolerance of the patients. Now, patients who have a very good exercise capacity, we leave them alone. And that we can ex uh, assess the patients on basis of a six-minute walk test and the quality of life questionnaire. Now, for patients who've got a very poor exercise tolerance and a very poor six-minute walk test, and who uh -huh. have a predominantly upper lobe emphysema, then we assess whether uh -huh. it is a homogeneous involvement or a heterogeneous involvement. Now, patients with a heterogeneous upper lobe emphysema, then we come down to the presence of collateral circulation. Now, collateral circulation or fissural integrity is what we call it. Basically means that the air is moving around from one lobe to the other lobe. Now, patients who have no collateral circulation or intact fissural integrity are the patients who are best benefited from any bronchoscopic or surgical options when it comes to severe emphysema. So, let us assume a patient has got bilateral upper lobe emphysema, which is heterogeneous in nature with no collateral circulation. Now, these patients would be ideal candidates for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery. Now, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery can be done in a variety of ways, the most common being endobronchial valves and coils. Also, the newer aspects of blocking. These are the aspects of blocking, and then we've got the stenosing or sclerosing options, such as sclerosing agents, fibrin glue, autologous blood, and thermal vapor ablation. So these all options can be targeted for patients with absence of collateral circulation and heterogeneous emphysema. Now, when a patient is having collateral circulation, in that case, the coils will fail. The coils and valves should be avoided in these patients. And we must consider thermal ablation, or probably stenting in these patients, along with fibrin glue and blocking. So these things can also benefit these patients. Now, even a homogeneous emphysema patient with or without collateral circulation can be given these options, but we have to explain that the results and the outcomes will not be as good as the ones in heterogeneous emphysema. Also, the complications such as an acute exacerbation of COPD, a pneumothorax, a pneumomediastinum, and an infection has to be explained to the patient before undertaking a procedure. Now, suppose a patient is not fit for a bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery or he is not willing for a bronchoscopic lung, redu lung reduction surgery. The conventional lung reduction surgery of bilateral upper lobectomy can be given to the patient. If a patient is having a bulla, a bullectomy should be the first option in these patients. Now, we've got three classes of patients. We've got a bullectomy, which is already been done. We've established bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery, homogeneous, heterogeneous, can be done. We've got a lung volume reduction surgery in the form of a bilateral upper lobectomy, which is already done. Now our patients are not candidates of all these. That is a severe COPD with an FE1 of less than 21, 25%, a PCO2 of more than 60, recurrent exacerbations, a single exacerbation resulting in corpulmonary or type 2 respiratory failure. Now these are our candidates where lung transplantation, that is a single sequential lung transplantation, that is both the lungs need to be transplanted at the single time, is the best option given to these patients. Now, all data tells us that the post-lung transplantation mortality and morbidity is high, 
but a 7 to 10 year survival rate is very good in these patients in all likelihood these patients will succumb to the illness much before that therefore they become very good candidates for lung transplantation any patient with a board severity of more than 6 a rapidly declining fe1 fec and fe1 fec ratio and multiple exacerbations should be kept in the loop for a lung transplant option at a future date apart from perfect maximum medical management and pulmonary rehabilitation no so all of these are available in india because you have you have just spoken about uh, the vapor ablation and all those also techniques and also the cost cost also benefit ratio how does it yes, measure into the accessibility of these of these of these of these also procedures and also the cost so to be very honest the number of interventional procedures in india is rising a lot of youngsters like myself and even senior stalwarts like yourself are into the foray and we are approaching these options we have a lot of help from the pharmaceutical industry as well in providing logistic support to the patient cost does become a challenge endobronchial valves endobronchial coils and thermal ablation is available thermal ablation is available at a very select few centers whereas coils and valves are being used at multiple centers across the country the option of uh, lung volume reduction surgery is still being used at multiple centers and yes lung transplant has come up in a big way in our country and covid has definitely helped and created awareness with respect to bronchoscopic interventions and lung transplant in the general population so i feel in the next 5 to 10 years interventional pulmonology in managing all respiratory illnesses will become a very important role for patients who are not getting the complete benefit from pharmacological therapy and ip and bronchoscopic interventions will act as a bridge way it will not only help us to buy time till the patients agree for lung transplantation also it may serve to prolong the life of patients who can't afford a complete lung transplantation number one and secondly who are not willing for such a drastic procedure so i think the trick is to choose i think the right patient for the right procedure yes. and yes, I you would, uh, and, and you would see the benefit uh, in them so well said dr abhay bansal thank you so much sir thank you sir thank you thank you dr agam and also, also thank you dr nimesh for being here and also thank you mankind for bringing this to us no thank the you. real credit goes to you rajesh bhai for moderating it so well you know thank it you. is with the hands of moderator to get the best out of discussion and make it so lively and interesting so i must thank you for moderating the session of course with animesh bhai there and avya there thing become always very simple thank you all delegates for your presence because it's only your presence which uh, make us do program and yes mankind for giving us the platform thank you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you dr rajesh swarnakar for bringing all the nuances in cpd with the help of your expert panel and i'm sure the audience is delighted to listen to all of you my next and a very very pleasant job is to introduce dr rajadhar he is the director and head department of pulmonology in at ck birla hospitals in kolkata he is the chair of training and education initiatives of indian chest society once again his name is very very closely associated with ics whenever ics is remembered raja is always remembered He is a director of Education and Research, National Allergy, Asthma and Bronchitis Institute in Kolkata. He is also a DNB coordinator, respiratory department, Fortis Hospital in Anandpur, Kolkata. Uh, chief coordinator of respiratory therapies course in collaboration with Jadavpur University. Honorary governing body member of Indian Chest Society from 2014 till date. he is the joint secretary of indian academy of allergy he is a national representative in european respiratory society uh, in he was in 2018 and he is an honorary assistant professor of tripura medical college as well apart from this he is one of the most prolific orators in this country in the field of pulmonology at this moment and you are going to soon witness that though he is going to be a moderator for the very very interesting session on interstitial lung diseases and interstitial lung diseases whether they are uip or non uip have been one of the most perplexing as well as challenging diagnosis that a pulmonologist encounters and the difficulties 
in the diagnosis and the management of interstitial lung diseases is one of the uh, mind boggling or challenging phenomenon that a pulmonologist has to go through. So with those words, it's over to you, Raja, for your panel and the discussion on the topic of interstitial lung disease. Thank you very much, Nitin. Thank you for those wonderful words of introduction. Welcome to day two of Best of NAPCON. And we are in the Best of ILD session. We'll do it like we have done in other sessions that you've heard through the day, today and on the 10th. And I'll start off by introducing my wonderful panel to you. We have with us Dr. Sujit Raja, who is a great friend. He is a consultant respiratory physician from Bombay Hospital in Mumbai. He is also a consultant respiratory physician at Bhatia Hospital in Mumbai. And he is a trainer, a teacher in respiratory medicine for the last 20 odd years. He is a core member of the Respiratory Research Network of India under the auspices of the Pure Foundation now. And he's been an ERS national delegate. Above all, he has got a dedicated interest in ILD. He's published wonderful review papers, which have been coming out of late, both in the IPF space and in the PF ILD space. So I can think of no one better than Sujit to be a part of this panel today. Thanks, Ron. The next person I introduce is Dr. Shitu Singh. Dr. Shitu Singh is a name to reckon with in the ILD field, even with being as young as she is. She is an assistant professor in the Institute of Respiratory Diseases, SMS Medical College, Jaipur. And because of her dedicated interest in ILD and her publications with the ILD Registry India, she's an appointed director, ILD and Pulmonary Rehab Clinic, Chief Interventional Pulmonologist. You would all know that she's the lead author of the ILD India Registry and the India ILD Guidelines with multiple publications in this area. Aside from ILD, she's also got dedicated interest in interventional pulmonology and research. The third colleague that I have today is Dr. Arjun Khanna. Dr. Arjun Khanna is a bright young pulmonologist who hails from the northern part of the country, from Delhi. He's ex-assistant professor, All Institute of Medical Sciences. He's just done an advanced IP fellowship from Bangkok in Thailand, and is currently working as senior consultant, pulmonary and critical care medicine, Yashoda Super Specialty Hospital in Koshambi, UP, and the Galaxy Hospitals, New Delhi. Multiple publications again, book chapters, and he has an interest in ILD and also in chronic respiratory failure and lung cancer. So that's our panel for today, and we'll crack, or crack on with the cases. So what I'm going to do now is to take you through three cases. The cases are real life cases, and we'll ask questions, your questions, in the course of presenting these cases. But before I do that, we'll set, put things in context, the fact that ILT has come a long way from about 125 years ago when the terminology fibrosis interstitial lung disease was coined by Reed Flish and Von Hanselman. The next year, it was called the cirrhosis of the lung. And then you've had from 2000 onwards an ATS ERS consensus definition and a diagnosis and treatment algorithm. And then moving forward, 2015, 17, and 18, we've had evidence-based guidance on IPF regarding diagnosis and management. Also, the fact that the global burden of disease data shows that ILD is becoming an important cause for mortality. About over the last 25 years, ILD has become a force to reckon with, with about 86% increase in the number of deaths from IMD. This is also likely related to more diagnosis of the disease and the better CT scans 
that we've had. This is a paper from 2017, which came out in JAPI, which I think epitomizes the unfilled gaps that we have in ILD management in our country. These gaps were also highlighted by the ILD India Registry, which Dr. Shitu Singh published along with all of us not so long ago. The fact that 30% thought that ILD and IPF are interchangeable terms, about 45% could not identify two important features of ILD on an HRCT. 30 to 40% people believed that steroids and azathioprine were useful, and more than 50% could not identify the two drugs that were thought to be useful in lung fibrosis. These are the features on CT scan for, I, for IPF, for the UIP pattern from the ATS ERS yeah, GRS ALAT criteria, which I won't elaborate on for the lack of time, but this is something that you guys should know and understand, and we'll try and touch on these as a part of the panel discussion. So let's come to the cases. Case one here is a very complex, interesting, but an unfortunate case of a young child, 10 years at the time of diagnosis, which is now about 12 years ago. The dad had died about two weeks before the child presented. The worried and believed mother brought her son along with a diagnosis of so-called asthma not being controlled. He also had a history of the grandfather having rheumatoid arthritis and some undefined breathing related problems. The grandfather died at the age of 62. He was a smoker and so was the dad who died of RAILD. And I'll give you some details about his father in a minute. There were huge anxiety issues, which I'm sure Sujit and the rest of the team today would appreciate when this child presented. In the past, the child also had a history of glandular TB when he was six years old. An FNA then from a cervical lymph node showed acid fast bacilli as being positive. He was treated with antitubercular drugs fully for about eight months. He had had cough for about two years at the time of presentation. He started on inhaled steroids and got better initially, but then got worse again. And there was no improvement in the cough thereafter. He had a CT scan, which I'm going to show you in a minute. He had multiple CT scans over a period of time, which was reported as having a fibrotic NSIP pattern. He had an ANA, which was strongly positive, and a rheumatoid factor, which was also positive initially. The family history I talked about, the father had died two weeks ago, I said, and he had RA-related ILD. His CT showed a UIP pattern, and he had classic rheumatoid arthritis, with deforming polyarthritis of the PIP and the DIP joints. He had high titers of rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP was positive, ANA was negative. This was before 2011, and hence he was treated with triple drugs at the time, and he died four years from the time of diagnosis. Let me show you the CT, and I'll first come to Sujit with what he thinks about the CT scan. I'll run this twice so that you can guys can see Is that visible to all of you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is a few years down the line after his diagnosis. This is not his first CT scan. This is after the disease had progressed and dates back to 2014. I'll run that for you again. This is the father's scan. Am I right, Raja? No, this is the kid's scan. Uh, I don't scan. have a scan. Yeah. So okay. this is the young boy's scan. This is from three years from when we detected him having ILD. That's the only scan I have. And I thought I'd just put one scan in. The scans worsened gradually over a period of time. And I'll tell you briefly the end of the story. But let's pause here for a moment. And... Sujit, so your thoughts on the CT scan there. And how old is this boy when the scan was done, Raja? The guy is 13 when the scan was done. Yeah. 13. Yeah. So firstly, I think we need to understand that uh, pediatric ILD is, is not a common condition, as you rightly mentioned, Raja. And whatever pediatric ILD, at least I've seen in clinical practice, has been more HP than, than uh, a very bad 
honeycombed lung like you're seeing in this scan. And this scan is clearly a subpleural ILE honeycombing. Uh, and also, if you look at it, the honeycombing is significantly present even in the upper lobes and anteriorly, which is what we don't have. Um, I, I notice uh, sagittal images, but this, you know, to look for the straight edge sign, but anterior upper lobe honeycombing is very typical uh, of a connective tissue disease ILD. And so considering his father had rheumatoid arthritis ILD, uh, his grandfather also died of uh, an ILD, uh, there would be a lot of concern in a 13-year-old boy with this kind of a picture. So there's, to me, uh, one would obviously do get his lung functions done. One would have to counsel the boy. Uh, he's 13 years old, so he's not that small, but at the same time, he is still a child uh, and talk to the parents. But I, I certainly think that this is a complex case. I wouldn't biopsy this child. Sure. And um, we could probably discuss more as we go along. Uh, I mean, sure. at this stage, I would say a fibrosing ILD with honeycombing um, and severity of the disease, difficult. I mean, it has to be estimated with lung function. Sure. I'd probably get some serology done on the boy for sure uh, and have a serious conversation with the family. So I haven't got a slide for this, uh, Sujit, but at yeah. the time, yeah. the boy had an FPC, which was 64%, sure. and a DLCO, which was 45%. So this is about three years from diagnosis. And right. this was the juncture when we started discussing transplant with the boy. Sure. At 15, which is the year from when you see the CT, yeah. the boy was wheelchair bound with oxygen. Right. He did his class 10 exams and his class 12 exams. Right. With oxygen right. on a wheelchair. The class 10 exams he did at home. Class 12, he went to school and did it with an invigilator coming at home for the class 10 exams. Sure. So the other question I wanted to ask you, and I think this is a, an important message, even if it's a brief one. Um, do you think this is familial IPF? Do you think this is um, RA associated ILD? Um, do you think it doesn't matter? The boy minded at this point did not have any features, clinical features, rheumatoid arthritis. Later on at 16, he came in with acute onset small joint arthropathy and the rheumatoid factor was strongly positive at the time. But when he got the diagnosis of ILD first five years, he had no features of rheumatoid arthritis. Sure. I, I think, Raja, the first point that you made, you know, and your question on your slide, uh, does it matter? Uh, obviously, familial interstitial pneumonia and RAILD are on the differentials here. But in an oxygen-dependent child, I don't think the differentiation really is going to make a difference to the pharmacological management in such a child. Because you would look to gain lung function with immunosuppression, which I'm assuming was already tried for this boy. Uh, and if you don't gain that, and this boy has become oxygen dependent, I would most certainly consider an antifibrotic to slow progression. I don't, familial interstitial pneumonia, for those in the audience who are not aware, is at least two uh, first degree relatives, a parent, a sibling, or a child has got an interstitial pneumonia. So you need two relatives there. You have two relatives clearly here. Uh, but having said that, the grandfather probably had IPF, the father had RAILD, and we know that in familial interstitial pneumonia, you can have combinations of someone having IPF, someone having fibrotic HP, and someone having a CTD ILD. Some of the genes are similar here. Having said that, does it make sense to do genetic testing? I don't think it's going to be, you're going to get some earth changing management changes with genetic testing in this boy. Uh, probably if this boy had had genetic testing done when he was just born, a few uh, years after that could have helped. But again, maybe you would have monitored this boy a little more closely, Raja. But having said that, um, what would that have done except increase the stress levels in the boy and the family? So it's very you know, difficult to do genetic counseling in family members uh, of 
a disease which is as bad as IPF or RA ILD with a UIP pattern, especially a father who has died young as well. So to me, genetic testing has to be done very carefully and thought of and explained to the family and the boy why they're doing it. Will it change uh, management? Uh, if you differentiate between the two, I don't think much at all. In this situation, it would be antifibrotic, good supportive care and counseling for transplant like you all already did. Sure, sure. So you've answered the second question on that slide. Will you answer the first for sure? The second does, does the diagnosis of familial pulmonary fibrosis matter from the management aspect? I don't think so. It, it does the history, yes. I mean, from the management aspect, you would probably be a little more aggressive with antifibrotic therapy, knowing that these patients can progress at a younger age, present at a younger age and progress faster sometimes. But we don't have that much data to tell us whether there's any specific management change. In fact, many clinical trials exclude familial inter uh, uh, IPF from their inclusion criteria. So data is yet sparse. Barring telomeropathies, where you have that rare syndrome, Raja, where you have bone marrow failure uh, and uh, uh, liver cell failure. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, you know, one of those syndromes, I forget the exact name, where Danazol... Hermansky Pudlak. Hermansky Pudlak. Hermansky Pudlak. Yeah. No, so Hermansky Pudlak is with, with the albinism and oculocutaneous albinism, right? So this is... Uh, uh, something else where bone marrow failure with liver cell failure, uh, some imperfecta, I forget the name, but whatever it is, it's rare. And that's where they've tried done a trial with Danazol, anabolic steroid, and shown some benefit in lengthening telomeres and, and improving survival. But otherwise, the treatments really are, are really, in terms of reversing the disease, are almost nil. And all you really have is when they go into bone marrow failure, you can do a bone marrow transplant. When you're going to liver cell failure, liver transplant. So how many organs are you going to really transplant? So prognosis, and it's all about counseling really and family members. And we know that in familial interstitial pneumonia, Raja, that there is often a two hit theory in the sense you have that genetic mutation and then you need another hit uh, with uh, we've just lost Raja, but I'm sure he'll join back. But we have another hit, which is either environmental or by smoking. So when you get a genetic mutation that is present in a family member, you would strongly advise them to look at their environment and quit smoking and avoid passive smoke exposure as well. So that that those management changes come into effect when you diagnose familial IP. Right. So I'm sorry, I think I lost you guys for oh, that's, uh, that's fine. 30 seconds, but that's just to put things which Sujit said into perspective, this is a slide which comes from Toby Mahir's group, one of the original slides looking at genetic susceptibility. The fact that there are certain genes, including ones which Sujit spoke about a little while ago, the mug 5 b the TOLIP, the TURD, etc. There has to be injury, which makes a change in these people with genetic susceptibility. And then with the aging process, you have activation of various pathways, which increases the fibrotic process in these individuals. I think that's probably going to suffice. And then the genetic profiling, as is shown in that particular slide, which again, Dr. Sujit Rajan spoke about. This is a 52 gene risk profiling. And the one thing that I wanted to add was this particular slide, which all of us on this panel have seen, but for the audience, the fact that going forward, not just for n acetylcysteine which is the study in question here, but for other drugs, you will probably have drugs which are tailored for certain genetic mutations in patients with IPF. So this looks at the TOLIP, CT, CC, and TT mutations. And the fact that in the TT mutation, you have a definite benefit. Whereas in the TOLIP, CC mutation, you have a disadvantage, you have an adverse effect by the prescription of the same drug, which is n acetylcysteine in this case. The other important question I wanted to touch on, and this is not just about pediatric uh, Sujit, this is also about adult. The fact that, do you think with the current evidence that we have in PFILD, 
identification of the underlying disease process, whether it's RA, whether it's scleroderma or anything else, Sjogren's for instance, does it matter or the fact that these people have an underlying disease process, the fact that it is progressing and this fibrosis in the form of honeycombing that you mentioned, the patients would be treated with the steroid and immunosuppressive and an antifibrotic suffices and the need for biopsy, etc., to try and find out an etiology does not really matter here. Sure. So quickly answering those questions, Raja, I think, uh, firstly, I don't want to recommend genetic testing routinely. I want to just cover the last part. I mean, every patient with an ILD should not undergo, you know, sure. we don't have that kind of data to suggest that, you know, we, we can really make a significant difference by routinely testing everyone. It's expensive, not easily accessible, sure. but it is a hugely evolving space and probably one of the biggest evolving spaces in ILD, and we need to watch that space. Uh, as far as this question is concerned, yes, this would probably be managed as a progressive fibrosing ILD because this patient is oxygen dependent. So obviously he's progressed. And we know that from some data from impulses on and from perfenidone data that uh, patients even with advanced fibrosis can survive longer uh, if the sure. antifibrotic is con continued. It may not be cost effective as per the NICE guidelines, but it is effective. So we need to offer them an antifibrotic, especially such a young child. Is identification of the underlying disease important? Your next question. Yes, Raja, I think it is because there is a significant amount of data with scleroderma, as we know, even upfront uh, antifibrotic therapy. Sure. Uh, but we know that RA, the incidence of ILD in RA is a little less than the other connective tissue diseases. So the maximum would be with the myositis uh, diseases, dermatomyositis and polymyositis. And the prognosis there is also better, can often be better, unless you have uh, an antibody like the anti-MBA5, which portends a worse prognosis. So doing a, an exhaustive serology helps in these patients to identify that patient who's likely to progress more. We know that anti-topomerase or ICL-70 positivity is associated with a worse prognosis, just like anti-MDA5. We don't have an antibody that tells us there's a better prognosis, but so therefore prognostication is important and thereby identifying which CTD it could be. Also, there is interesting, more interesting data, I feel, with drugs like rituximab for the myositis uh, group. And so that management change could occur when you see inflammation uh, and a myositis-related uh, connective tissue disease, ILD, and you get really good long-term stability in responders. So I think in those situations, sure. under, identifying underlying disease is important, and we shouldn't just blanket call everyone with a fibrosing ILD and we have discussed this in the past. Sure. Progressive fibrosing ILD. Sure. Uh, my question was also about diseases like chronic HP, sarcoid, etc., sure. where you would have a PFILD pattern, but maybe we'll come to that as we go along to the uh, other cases that we have so, in a moment. Yeah. Just so, a quick line on that, yeah. Raja. Sarcoid yeah. very rarely progresses. It's one of the rarer uh, sure. progressive fibrosing ILDs, but it does, but it's a minority and the inbuilt data had a very small number of sarcoid patients. Sure. Uh, sure. But FHP is big time and a sure. subject of a talk itself. It's so common in India, sure. as Shitu has shown us in her registry. So sure. that's another subject altogether. Sure. And uh, you answered this question for me already, Sujit. So uh, for this boy, we actually gave him steroids. The immunosuppression was in the way of uh, mycophenolate. So that's what we give, gave him. Yes. And we started in perfinidone. A uh, lot of it was without evidence because I don't think there's any evidence about antifibrotic in the pediatric space. Sure. However, we went along and there was progressive fibrosis. So we thought that giving an antifibrotic probably would be a rational thing to do. So I think we've answered this already. Um, and we have answered this. So let me... I'll go to case two in a moment, but any quick comment from you, Shitu or Arjun about this case, any carry home messages for, your, for our audience who's listening in today? I think it was an important case and you know, these kind of rare cases do come in. And what I have noticed in familial ILD is that, you know, the uh, subsequent generation, the ILD presents at a younger age. So for example, the father is presenting at 40, you know, the child here is presenting at 
probably 10 or 15 so similarly i have also noted this although it is uh, nowhere given in literature but what is your call have you seen you know the subsequent generation presenting at a younger age yeah i agree, i agree with you shito at least i mean i've seen 60 year old parents 65 and then the son presenting at 45 50 i haven't seen uh, uh i have to be honest i haven't seen a honeycomb lung at the age, at such a young age i mean but it's interesting it's very interesting the the case that raja brought sure. so i think if you look at the ctd ilt basket obviously the age of presentation she too is slightly younger as compared to what you have in the ipf arena so that's that's for sure but you are right so i have actually seen about seven or eight of these cases young boys young lesser number of girls but young boys seen about three young kids two boys and one girl with sarcoid which presented very early with a very strong family history you know three family members having sarcoid so that's that's a fact and we have reported that and published that but uh, i think being aware about the family history is something that is a carry home message from all of us that's the first message the second me- message is about the fact that you need to be aware about transplant just to complete the story for this guy he went across and had a transplant done which was when he was 19 did well for about 8 months got a bad pneumonia just pre covid and then died of the pneumonia about a month down the line so unfortunately not a very happy story at the end of the day but i think it makes us think even a younger population and i want you to remember the fact that these this boy actually had a diagnosis of asthma to start with so any young boy who comes in with breathlessness does not amount to asthma is another important key message that all of us in this panel would like to give you arjun anything to add or shall him sir because i think ild gets diagnosed very late in our country and uh, every disease every respiratory disease in india gets treated as asthma or tb so sure. for the gps who are listening to us today ild is a definite diagnosis it is something that we pick up more often these days and even in the younger population keep your radar on it sure. can present in any age sure thanks arjun so that i think definite messages from a case which is rare we'll come to a case which is very common sujith alluded to this already so this is sujith the uh, uh, guys this is the 60 year old lady from delhi with cough and worsening breathlessness definite exposure to pigeons and also had the air cooler which he had had for a very long time she had had for a very long time that's the ct and only a few cuts of them that's an expiratory film and i think there are no exciting puzzles in the diagnosis here it's chronic hp you've got definite triggers couple of triggers and you can pick and choose which one it is and a ct which is reasonably the sort of diagnostic and again coming to the various papers that are available the literature which is available the epidemiology of hp seems to vary across the world so 2% to 47% depending on which country you pick so 2% in new mexico is what we have said in the europe it's somewhere between 15 to 20% picking any country in western europe that you fancy and then in india we have a prevalence from the ild india registry of 47% i hope you see my cursor on there that's um, our paper dr shitu singh's paper which says 47% but even within the country a very robust study from the northern part of the country seems to indicate a smaller number and that's from pgi chandigarh so even within within the country probably there's some variability um a lot of people are exposed to the triggers which cause chronic hp only a few are however affected and the reason seem to be similar to what we said in familial hp which is that there could be a trigger which is the respiratory inflection which could be something like influenza a etc and i won't go through this classification but i will allude to it or i'll have Dr. Shitu Singh alluding to this as we go along in trying to get to a diagnosis of chronic HP. So I start off with this question for you, Shitu. Um, how do you diagnose an HP? So we're not talking about guidelines, but in your practice, how would you diagnose HP, or would it be a variety of these in with the way you diagnose HP in your practice? And also sort of touch on. I gave you a very brief history in that case, but how would you have done it in that particular case? Were those CT images with the history enough, or would you go on to do more? I think the most important thing is to keep the threshold 
of having you know an ild very low in your clinical practice uh when a patient walks in you know very breathless and when he or she sits down they become comfortable over time and the patient has a dry cough progressive and uh, then is the point where you you know start suspecting an ild uh, and probably an hp subsequently so get very simple test and basic test like a spirometry a 6 minute which shows a desaturation so once these are done get a ct scan and this is for all the gps that getting a threshold for getting a good quality hrct is important once you have a good quality scan and you find that there is some down glassing some air trapping an upper lobe predominant disease or with a positive exposure history and for that you need to spend time with your patient you have to you know ask sometimes uh, leading questions that do you you know uh, give uh, feed the birds do you have moles in your house do you do farming activities so many times these uh, exposures are uh, considered to be you know very innocuous to the patient and they don't mention it so you need to spend time and find out these exposures so sure. once you have this scan with you you have a positive exposure history that means that you have a scan which has some uh, mosaic pattern with ground glass air trapping normal lung maybe it is not there but you find you know uh, a kind of fibrotic pattern which dr rajadhar just elaborated in his slide with you know upper lobe predominant disease some areas of air trapping but with other areas of fibrosis that is any disease or exposure that is more than 6 month would be irreversible leading to a chronic hp type of pat so once you have these then the best next test is to get a bronchoscopy done and collect a good bronchoalveolar lavage a lavage can be easily done you know uh, at uh, small centers also you don't need a lot of expertise if the bronchoalveolar lavage shows a lymphocytosis that is more than 30% you can you know confidently diagnose a patient with hp you don't need to uh, sub, uh, get a biopsy done so a positive exposure history a ct scan suggestive of either an acute or chronic hp along with a bal lymphocytosis is uh, a good enough diagnosis for hp sure. there are now certain other tests such as you know a uh, exposure history with a positive precipitant test and these tests however have to be interpreted very carefully so if you have all this and a positive igg it is highly suggestive of hp due to that particular antigen sure. however many you know patients who are getting exposed to pigeons but they don't have hp like pattern they may have a false positive igg so a precipitant test in the correct clinical and radiological context is important and there you can actually diagnose hp so this has already been validated you know by the washa sure. koba group and subsequent the ats guidelines have also highlighted this sure no wonderful ashitu so i think you have beautifully summarized all of it i think the only point you went to the basic the dry cough coming into clinic with a bit of breathlessness uh, the only point i have to add very basic which is to listen to the chest isn't it make sure you listen to the chest if you hear crackles if you hear the squeaks and squawks in patients they normally have a small airways involvement which would lead you to a di- direction of chronic hp even before you've actually done a ct scan in these individuals so that's one thing to add to the beautiful description that you just gave um quickly she to two minutes because we're running out of time how would you treat so you've treated the individual let's say you've identified the trigger like it was for this lady 60 year old lady the pigeons let's say was the source you want her to remove them from the source now what do you do in the way of treatment steroids nothing just removal of the trigger immunosuppression anti fibrotics how do you combine what's your thought process so uh, for acute hp i think things are clear you start straight away with steroids if you know the patient has a desaturation 
But for chronic HP, uh, now some data suggests that steroids may actually be harmful. Sure. At that point, uh, you actually get a pulmonary function test done a six minute. Is the uh, patient having a low FPC? Is he or she desaturating? And then you start with steroids. Uh, follow up the patient. If the patient shows signs that this is a progressive fibrosing ILD, which means that there is a fall in the FPC, fall in the diffusion, patient gets more symptomatic, there's a worsening on the radiology. At that point, you can then start up with an antifibrotic because you don't know how long you have to give the antifibrotic. So my personal take, although there are no studies, I always start up with steroids. Sure. If I'm having trouble with the steroids, the patient is not tolerating a lot of side effects, uh, patient doesn't want to take the steroids, I start with an immunosuppressor. And along with that, if there is a progression of fibrosis, then we start with an antifibrotic. Uh, personally, I start with linterdenum because the data currently sure. suggests uh, linterdenum and I will await data for perfinitum. Okay. And uh, positioning the immunosuppressant here? Immunosuppressant would be to, you know, if the patient has side effects from the steroids, I'm not able to taper the steroids. Sure. Is okay. the point where you start an immunosuppressant either azathioprine or mycophenolate mode. Sure, sure. So that's the data. So very quickly, I think we're running out of time. So that's the paper which Dr. Sheetu Singh is quoting. That's a comparison of my, between mycophenolate and azathioprine and chronic HP. And the gist is that used as a steroid sparing agent, the way she described, there's not a lot of difference between the two. However, mycophenolate seems to be a safer option as compared to azathioprine, which seems to have more side effects. And hence, mycophenolate is used more as a steroid sparing agent in most conditions, including chronic HP, as things stand today. Quick 30-second remarks from Sujit and Arjun before we move to the last case, which we'll only have three or four minutes for. So, yeah, just, just a quick remark, Raja, that I agree with most of what Sheetu said, uh, except that we are now increasingly seeing a number of patients who would like to take an alternative immunosuppressant rather than steroid up front. And we do counsel them that we may not get as rapid an improvement that we would get with prednisolone, uh, but we are giving them that option to, to consider it. Uh, and our duration of steroids is significantly reduced. I mean, 15 years ago, I would probably have given steroids for a year or two before tapering uh, and today, I rarely give steroids for more than three months sure. and a maximum of six months. Sure. So a message to the audience, just so that we have a sort of uniform message going out, uh, Sujit, is that for most people, it would be probably three to six months of steroids, maybe starting immunosuppression slightly earlier as compared to what we did before, so that we could get patients off the steroids early on in the disease for course. Yes. And the immunosuppressant for longer as compared to what we have done till date, isn't it? That's the sort of gist. Absolutely. And especially yeah. if you see a strong non-fibrotic component. Sure. Okay. And if you see a predominantly fibrotic component, you may even yeah. want to question whether you need an immunosuppressant on. Yeah. You know, and, and discuss the pros and cons of combining it with an sure. antifibrotic vis-a-vis antifibrotic alone. But those are usually wow. case to case. Sure. Arjun. So, so a lot of our physician friends have started using antifibrotics now. So the message that needs to go across is that these drugs have their own set of side effects. You need to monitor them accordingly. And these drugs are not going to take care of the symptoms. A lot of physicians believe that, you know, post-COVID, especially everyone has been using them. This is going to take care of the cough. This is going to take care of the breathlessness. No, it doesn't happen that way. Sure. This is a slow acting drug. At best, this is going to just decrease the decline of the lung function. Sure. So a lot of time our patients go back thinking that this drug is going to make a lot of you know, it's going to change their outcomes or their uh, or their lives drastically. It doesn't happen. So if you're using these drugs as general physicians, make sure that you know about their side effects and you know how to monitor these drugs, liver function tests, cardiac toxicities, all of these need to be borne in mind when you are using these drugs. Sure. So wonderful messages. First, I think the fact that a good history, identification of triggers, trying to make sure that you do an IgG where relevant and interpreting it accordingly along with the bad lymphocytosis, clinches the diagnosis of chronic HP in far greater number of cases as compared to what we did before. I think the treatment we have talked about already, 
select number of cases for biopsies, not as many as we used to biopsy before, but do it judiciously when there's a lack of response or when the pattern does not, the CT pattern does not fit the clinical suspicion, you might have to end up doing a biopsy and the fact that antifibrotics need to be used with caution. Let's go on to case three, four or five minutes, guys. Quick case or a quick couple of cases, both with the same message. So 66 year old male, current smoker, 50 pack year history, dry cough, but disproportionately breathless. And when I say disproportionately breathless, I mean disproportionate compared to the FPC, which in this individual was normal. So disproportionate compared to the lung physiology, but you would note while I've said the FPC is preserved, the DLCO is rock bottom at about 30%. And the echo here showed severe pulmonary hypertension. So Arjuna, I'll come back to the interpretation of the X-ray and CT to you in a moment, but I just wanted to another patient. This is another 60 year old minor lives in Asansol where the AQI, believe it or not, is still at about 350. Not very diff different to where you live, Arjun. Yeah. So uh, the CT is in front of you. So I wanted to discuss both of these two cases together. So first, a quick interpretation of the two CTs. What you think about the lung physiology and how it ties in with the CT scan. Sure. And then a diagnosis and we'll move on from there. Arjun. So in this X-ray and the CT sub, both we can see that the upper lobes appear to be hyperinflated. There is, uh, if you see in the CT scans, there is emphysema there. There's central orbular emphysema. On the other hand, there is a contrasting thing going on in the bases of the lung. The upper lobes are hyperinflated. The lower lobes are showing fibrosis. So the patient is a smoker. So there's a common risk factor for both the diseases happening together in a single patient. So emphysema, which can be related to cigarette smoking and the development of ILD again, which can be related to cigarette smoking. And a lot of these patients, this, this clinical condition is known as CPF, your combined pulmonary fibrosis with emphysema. And what you said that the breathlessness is out of proportion to spirometry. So in spirometry, in an obstructive airways disease, you expect obstruction. In an ILD, you expect, expect restriction. But due to the counterbalancing of both the forces here, you tend to get normal or near normal PFTs, but the patient is miserable. So you do diffusion capacities and obviously because there is lung destruction here because of emphysema and fibrosis going on together, the diffusion capacity is very poorly, you know, the, the diffusion capacity is really poor. And also, so you've already pointed out that the patient has pulmonary hypertension. These patients who have the combination of both ILD as well as emphysema happening together in them, the chances of them developing pulmonary hypertension as compared to either ILD or emphysema alone would be much higher. In fact, more than 50% of these patients at the time of diagnosis would have some amount of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Sure. That is CPFE. Again, sure. in the second CT scan, sir, that we can see there is there is some amount of hyperinflation going on in the upper lobes. However, the, the predominant pattern here is fibrosis. There's traction bronchiectasis. There is kind of honeycombing going on or probably, you know, but still there are areas of paraseptal emphysema, kind of these, you know, these hyperinflated, these, these um, shadows that can be appreciated here. So again, this is a combination of, this is, this is a disease pathology wherein the patient has fibrosis along with air traffic. Sure. Wonderful. So you've answered most of my questions, actually. Why is CPFE important? It's for the reasons that Arjun spoke about. The fact that this is a disease of smokers, the fact that the DLC is rock bottom here, the fact that these people have more pulmonary hypertension and hence a greater mortality as compared to each individual component, be that emphysema or be that pulmonary fibrosis. Um, I'll miss that just to show that, that this population of patients has probably got one of the highest mortality numbers if you look at across the ILD basket. And that's the patient population who have it. Just a quick one-liner, Arjun, about management you so, emphasize on the emphysema component the ild component both how do you treat these individuals so also sir one more complication is lung cancer around 50 percent of these patients would actually develop lung cancer during the course of their illness so most of the studies on ipf or ilds have actually excluded patients with cpfe so there is no clear-cut data, there is no crystal data regarding how to manage these patients. There is definitive, uh, you know, the, 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 the arguments in favor of, because treating anyone with emphysema is relatively easy, right? You can start these patients on bronchodilators. I would upfront start these patients on a combination of LABA along with anti therapy, anticholinergic therapy. 
and there is no clear cut data on anti fibrotics in this entity because most of the patients have been excluded from the trial however if the patient develops you know if the patient if i have uh, evidence that the patient has worsening fibrosis which would be the case in this in this anyways okay. i would personally go ahead and use anti fibrotics give the patient the benefit of doubt because i don't have any data to support either sides of the coin sure so treat the emphysema like you would treat the interstitial lung disease look for an etiology for the interstitial lung disease like you would do in the ilt basket and if this fibrosis then i would too like you arjun use an anti fibrotic in these individuals even though there is lack of data having said that some patients in impulses actually had cpfe and been included in the trial so we have a little bit of data not a lot but i would prescribe like you said anti fibrotics so one line message is maybe sujeet shitu and we'll come to you arjun in the end a carry home message for the audience before we finish we've run over time so messages from our panelists today before we call it quits for the ilv session a quick message on cpfe is i've rarely been able to counsel these patients for transplant because they're usually much older patients yes. uh, raja so we don't get an opportunity very often worse prognosis with pulmonary hypertension so this patient had severe pulmonary hypertension definitely a worse prognosis in cpfe particularly and that's the main message really and i sure. agree with everything else that arjun said shitu i would uh, encourage all the audience to you know emphasize the need to quit smoking because smoking is what causes the emphysema the ipf and the lung cancers uh, another thing is a holistic approach in the, these type of patients treating the copd the ild the ipf along with pulmonary rehabilitation would i think uh, be pivotal uh, to improve the quality of life in such patients wonderful Arjun, a last message from you. Not generally about CPFE, but sort of uh, about the ILD. ILD is extremely common in our country. We tend to not diagnose it early, and most of the times, by the time we pick it up, we the patient is already in respiratory failure. So the I think the very important message that should go across today is that ILD is something that happens. Try to pick it up, as Shitu said. Very simple tests. Ask the patient to walk in your OPD. Auscultate the patient if you see crackles. The patient rapidly desaturating. These are very common pointers that you will see, and ILD is very common. So pick it up in time. Also. we always tend to rely on pharmacotherapy for the treatment of ild we need to understand the pharmacotherapy treatment modules are not many and most of the times we would not be very effective what would be effective is pulmonary rehabilitation and oxygen therapy and you know overall changing the overall health perspectives of these patients so more than the drugs it is exercise therapy pulmonary rehab and oxygen which is going to be effective in these patients sure sure and sort of uh, i'll say something which uh, is usually left to sujeet to say but just to say that a lot of these patients need palliation a lot of these patients in the absence of a very robust transplant program in this country will end up needing palliation i think as a group we need to be more aware about palliating these individuals when they come in with an exacerbation or when they are very breathless or have a chronic refractory cough that is one area where we need to focus on learn from each other and support these patients So thank you very much for uh, being a part. So my wonderful panel, Sujit, Shitu, Arjun, thank you very much. A big thank you to mankind for being with us in the best of NAPCON, and hopefully we'll see you all at NAPCON 2022 at Udaipur. So I hand over to for the next session. I'll hand over to Dr. Nitin Abhankar to take the session forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raja. for this wonderful uh, i i i have echo if i'm not wrong so just check that out if if there is an echo if something has can we done um yeah i think the, i'll i'll put the first question to dr uh, bavin uh, and bavin uh, congratulations for that wonderful panel that you conducted <laughs> i think one question which has been asked to you is about uh, whether we should be reporting the nodes on ct scan and and do you report them and what do you do with them when you are dealing with uh, diffuse pulmonary lung diseases and uh, of course i mean sarcoid is a different story but for the rest of them and this is from deep kulkarni in i think mumbai yeah so we do report uh, lymph nodes in fact in my structured format we have a space for lymph nodes 
they become relevant only when they're more than 10 millimeters in short axis. And if they're more than 10 millimeters in short axis, again, if there is a strong inflammatory component, let's say you have an acute subacute HP, or you have an acute exacerbation in an IPF, then you don't bother even up to 15 millimeters. If the patient is in failure, then we know that we get nodal congestion because of lymphatic um, obstruction. Then again, we don't bother. So okay. only if the lymph nodes are really big, conglomerate, prevascular space, you know, in the region of the thymus, then we start saying, okay, maybe there is a coexistent pathology that is creating a problem. That's right. I think, I think Deep, you have got your answer from Bhavin. I have one question for you, Bhavin, and this is a tough one. Uh, how do how do you, you know, you've been there in this business for as long as I am or a little longer than me. How have you balanced the new generation CTs which have kept coming, the cost, the, the value that you give to your customers? And how do you balance the whole financial versus this kind of a game? You know, it, it's it's tough, isn't it? I mean, and 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 that image, this is a phenomenal. I mean, it's it's a huge thing across the nation. And how have you managed it? So we want the secret of your success. <laughs> so, so <laughs> you know, in the early days, it was very difficult because we the pace of change was so fast that we had to replace machines every four to five years. And that made it very difficult. The current generation of machines are over-engineered, which means that if you buy a top-of-the-line machine today, you pretty much in CT don't need to change it for another 10 to 14 years, depending oh. on when that's you like, bought the machine. That's, that's so now, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So now that we have a longer span, um, then it, it becomes much easier because you pay off your loan in the first four or five years, then you have a reasonable amount of time. Uh, I think this is one question from Raja to you. And uh, he's asking, what is the future of non-interventional radiologists? Because I think everybody has a needle or a biopsy needle in this hand. And uh, is there anything left for them? So, 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 Bhavit, Bhavin, so yeah. the question, so just to add to what Nitin said, so in the era of artificial intelligence going forward, what is the oh. future of non-interventional radiologists was my question. Ah, that uh -huh. way. Uh, that's even, it's even more interesting. That makes more <laughs> sense, yeah. No, so AI is a huge hype. Uh, we don't expect AI to do anything except be enablers. So right now, and we see this happening in the next 15, 20 years as well. What AI really does is, at least for CT, it makes, it gives us, it takes measurements, things that we find tedious to do, it will do. It will measure, quantify, uh, give us patterns and make everyone's life simpler and easier to read. But it doesn't, it, it will never read the scan. It will only give us pointers fill in some gaps, fill in some, you know, things that allow us to be better at our job. So that's not going to happen. Chest x-rays may be a different ball game because chest x-rays anyway are only 50% of are read by radiologists anyway on a daily basis. 50% are never read. And in tier two, tier three cities, district hospitals, where there are no radiologists anyway reading x-rays, uh, the physicians will be enabled using AI to read x-rays for sure. There is no question there. But CT is too complex to, you know, for AI to read a CT. It will be a great enabler, no issue. Excellent, excellent. I think great insights uh, from uh, Bhavin. Thank you, Bhavin, for being with Thank us you. and for conducting that brilliant panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hey, Nitin, I, just one little thing. Huh? You're one year older than me. So you've been oh, really, I mean, this longer than You're reminding me of my age. Come on. I mean, you look so young. <laughs> okay. I move over to Ra Rajesh. And these are some questions to you. I think one quintessential question which keeps coming uh, in COPD sector. What is the role of theopalin when, say, you are given lava lama and still the patient is symptomatic? So I think if you've got this combination of lava and lama and if he's still symptomatic, uh, basic is to go back and also check his inhaler technique. If he's quite comfortable with that, uh, 
you can change the device or if there is also compliance after checking this if i find that uh, he's still he's self symptomatic then of course uh, cold says that you have to add uh, basically ics as a third uh, the combination lava lama and ics inhaler but indian guidelines do say that you can use uh, this uh, theophylline although the evidence is less that theophylline is actually a moderate or modest or mild i think what to block the letter uh, but then there are studies which says that if you use this theophylline along with also salmetrol there is some benefit so i think if you say uh, i would add ics first and uh, maybe after that uh, i would add theophylline because these patients also have what is called cardiac uh, uh, also problems so theophylline can have what is called tachycardia and all those uh, the side effects they will also be there with that so i would be quite cautious in fact in adding theophylline to a lava lama rather than going to which lava lama and ics combination which which would be thing apt yeah i'll i'll now keep on tossing between you two so raja the next question is to you for the ild and somebody has asked about i think anu vargis uh, from palakkad she has asked about nac in ild that's number 1 and the role of phenotyping and there is also a sub question to that i mean genotyping and you know, how often and sure. how frequently and how realistically can you do it? sure so all very valid questions i'll uh, come to the first one which is uh, so the first question was about so phenotyping genotyping what was the first one nac right nac right. nac yeah. NAC. so unfortunately the phenotype the genotype which seems to be the most common is the one where nac causes damage when nac actually causes worsening of ipf so if you look at the ipf literature nac is generally not supposed to be used in patients of ipf contrary to the panther data which went out of vogue sometime around 2011 before which we used to uh, use triple therapy in these patients so nac is a no no nac does not go well with perfenidone it seems to reduce the effect of perfenidone so i would try and avoid using nac in patients with ipf there is not much of data in the pf ild category that's sort of in the pf ild category we don't have data but again i would be cautious because a lot of data in pf ild is actually extrapolated data from ipf so that's about the nac question then comes phenotyping i think phenotyping is important we do phenotyping one of the cases or a couple of cases that we discussed in the the panel that we did was people who are smokers so smokers normally indicate to an overlap between emphysema and interstitial lung disease and you yeah. saw in both these cases that in one there was predominant ild in the other there was predominant emphysema and hence trying to categorize these patients phenotyping these patients helps to prioritize which management would be more important there's yeah. other ways to do phenotyping genotyping unfortunately is not something that we are doing in this country or even overseas just now it's still more of a research tool the fingerprinting that we talk about in the ild basket is still in the research stage but it's a space that we need to watch out for going forward there will be more information we will I, have the drugs that, that, that question came because of the first familial ipf that you showed you know and it's a very scary thought you know 13 year old getting an ild which is as bad as that so i think something you know where you would want to know right in the womb whether this person is susceptible or not you know i think that that probably prompted that question so i'll i'll, I'll move on to the next question and this is from anu varg is again to rajesh uh, this is roflumulast role in cpd and if i'm starting it how long will i continue it and that kind of a thing so i think there was some yeah. answers so, given to roflumulast question so rajesh yeah. are you hearing me yeah yeah, yeah i'm 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 hearing you Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, so it's roflumulast is actually phosphodiesterase inhibitor, and its role is there if suppose you have got these three inhalers, uh, what lava, lama, and ICS, and still if patient is having exacerbations after that, then there is an option for you to go to this roflumulast. Uh, if you ask me, we had we had started giving it, but it has fallen out of use, and I would also ask your experience because. because of its side effects it used to cause uh, what to call weight loss and imagine a patient of copd having cachexia and again you have a weight loss with a drug that you use to prevent 
its exacerbation. Uh, there was also some problem also bleeding PR. So if you ask me, I started uh, actually using this when this ICS Lava and Lama combination is there is is not out of working and and is still having exacerbation. Uh, but because of its side effect, I would go for other options which are there like like you know some acrylide uh, antibiotics to be to be just given thrice weekly or some other stuff rather than rufflimlas. So I think the role is limited. And mostly when we started it way back, and I would also ask Raja about his experience, but we had to stop it because of these, yeah. because this had to be, we then actually we then couldn't uh, also use it for long. Yeah, I think the obese guys is the best idea because yeah, you know, the obese, they actually and tend to lose, most of them lose weight. So it might yeah. be welcome in obese guys, actually. And, and when the rest of the parameters are met. Uh, Raja, you have any thoughts on this? I mean, so quick, quick comment, Nitin. Yeah, so very quick comment. I agree with both of you. I think there was this trial in 2019, which was called the Reliance trial. I sort of uh, remember it from the Ambani family, actually. So the Reliance trial, which... Uh, sort of indicates that it's the obese phenotype, the chronic bronchitic phenotype who produce lots of phlegm, where this drug seems to work and work well. But it's a very small niche population of Goldie patients. If you give it to the rest, you actually cause more side effects the way Rajesh was describing a little while ago, rather than effect. And a trial for three months, and then a decision to continue or discontinue, I think is the way forward with Roflubinasa. I, I absolutely agree with you. I seem to be a, a azithromycin guy one way or the other. Yeah. And somehow I land up putting many of my patients on azithromycin till they almost become deaf. So mm -hmm. I think, of course, we have to watch for that space. Absolutely. But I think, uh, of course, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the funny part of it apart, but I think azithromycin has some role in preventing exacerbations. And it does help some patients, not, not all, but some patients. Yeah, so especially ex-smokers. Yeah. COPD, uh, those patients, and you should rule out also that he has got no mods and all those infections. Okay. So I think you can use uh, this what low-dose macrolide antibiotics maybe thrice a week. Uh, Raja, now three questions to you, one after the other. Uh, one is, uh, where do you place uh, the value of ACE levels in sarcoid? Uh, this is from Deep Kotari. And uh, then there is a, a question about steroids, how long in sarcoidosis? Uh, and the most uh, critical one, according to me, is uh, by Anu Varghese again, how long to use MMF in HP and more importantly, when to start it? So you yeah. can take whichever sequence you want. And, and Rajesh, you can also come in because it's not exclusive to... <laughs> So Nitin, let me do it the reverse way around because I'll yeah. remember it better. So yeah. the first is the duration of MMF in patients with chronic HP. The trial that we quoted, the 2019 trial, used it for a period of one year. And all the data that we have, two papers actually, that's all the data we have, is over one year. If you try and extrapolate the steroid and MMF data from sarcoid, which is a similar disease, centri uh, uh, centrilobular disease, uh, uh, they used it for 12 to 18 months. And I would recommend that we use it for a similar duration of time in patients with chronic HP also, but it's extrapolated data, data, but it's about a year or so. When do you introduce it? We said you introduce it relatively early because you want to get these patients off steroids early. So exactly. probably at two to three months, if you don't get perfect control, you introduce it at that point of time. How long with steroids? Lesser duration with steroids. We said three to six months. You heard that Dr. Rajan uh, said the same thing. So three to six months is what we are talking about. In an exceptional patient, you might continue it for longer, especially when symptoms are difficult to control. But otherwise, it's three to six months. Yeah. And the other, what was the first question again? Uh, sorry, Nitin. The, the first questions are related to sarcoid. One is ACE levels. I think yeah. that's relatively yeah. simple. And the other one is how long to continue with steroids. Yeah. Again, the same yeah. duration. Yeah. yeah, sure. So uh, ACE is not useful. Let us sort of put it uh, very briefly. Definitely. But is that is that what I do in my clinical practice? No, I don't. I would do an ACE level when I see a patient with sarcoid. And I think I feel comfortable when along with my uh, 
report on EBUS TBNA along with my MAN2 test, along with my serum calcium, I see an ACE which is raised. It gives me a little bit of comfort that yeah. everything is consistent. But that's about it. I don't think there's any data to and show. If I have a MAN2 negative, I'm extremely happy. Yeah. Continuing yeah, steroid yeah. for Correct. a little long. Correct. Correct. So, like you say, Nitin, I think it's multiple points put together, and ACE forms a very small cog in that wheel. That's okay. all there is. Yes. Duration of steroids in sarcoid is 12 to 18 months because this Bob Bauman paper from about 10 years ago showed that if you stopped steroids before one year, the chance of recurrence goes up by about 30%. Correct. So, you continue on a, a small dose till about a year or so. If the patient does well, you stop at a year. But if it doesn't, if you still have symptoms, you go to 12 to 18 months is the carry home message. I, I have a counter question to both of you and on the HP part of it, because I, I see a lot of them with unidentified antigen, having a chronic HP and needing steroids. And if you don't give them, they become either hypoxic or they or become much worse. They become having much, much worse breathlessness. Uh, you have MMF going on and you have on the smallest possible dose of steroids. Then how long will you continue? Both Rajesh and uh, uh, I'm going to quiz, uh, grill you today. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, that's quite a difficult question to identify basically allergen in a patient who had this, uh, this exposure and is still going on. Uh, which is just causing this uh, this problem. Uh, we do give basically steroids in this uh, in this patient for acute exacerbation when it happens. But I think I would like to taper it, and I would like to see how uh, how it how it really behaves behaves in also CT and this thing, and then I would decide. Raja, yeah. So um, I go along with what you said, Rajesh. Uh, I think it's important if you feel that there is ongoing trigger allergen exposure. I think it's important to try and make an effort to identify the trigger. If you don't remove the trigger, I think with or without steroids, with or without MMF, your lung will continue to undergo fibrosis. The disease will continue to progress. So I think if the disease is progressing in spite of your steroid and mycophenolate, the moot question is, what is the trigger which is causing it? Go hunt it out, try and find what the trigger is, because otherwise, irrespective of what drugs you give, the disease is bound to progress. Absolutely. I think it's a very valid, valid point, but many a times in real life scenarios, you are just forced to sort of, you know, take the call on not uh, identify, you know, uh, uh, labeling this as an uh, HP with an unidentifiable yeah. allergen. Yeah. And then so it becomes chronic and fibrotic. And then, the, of course, the antifibrotic is not what I'm going to ask you because that is relatively easier to take the decision on. So, uh, so I mean, do you so, buy this theory of cooler exposure, which was given in the HP that people use it? In this because of course in Nagpur and all we do use and this thing so does it cause which was given in the earlier very frankly this is always always the data from north and yeah, I think not, you know, Nagpur is Nagpur or Solapur I don't see them you know because they are hot yeah tests. because everybody is using cooler here and everybody is using uh, that match that are uh, that are kept for the rest of the year like that and then they only use during summer and right. there are molds and fungus and whatnot so I don't know whether it's causing so we'll have to really Goes into awkward. This is this is a matter of you know where, why what, the minimum I ask nowadays for HP is a video shooting of the entire home and the surroundings, <laughs> and I look at it and sit sit with ten minutes video with the patient and tell him to describe what all things are there in your house, yes, and it might actually go a long way because in today current scenario home visits are nearly impossible. Yeah. So I think the minimum I can ask for is a home video recording yeah. and the surrounding records, and that they, they, yeah. they sometimes give you the clue. The pigeons which they have been not not noticing, they get noticed because they are sitting there somewhere, and they say, "Oh, have you been exposed?" To them and say, oh, they have been there for all <coughs> sometimes miss out on important clues. Uh, Raja, you have something to add? <laughs> so I was just going to say, you know, this there was this uh, paper from um, Dr. Virendra Singh, which I don't think got published ultimately. They looked at about 27 odd patients with air coolers who had chronic HP. They took swabs and sent it for culture. And in line with what you said, Rajesh, they actually found molds in about 60% of them. So maybe it's not the air coolers, it's actually the molds, the aspergillus, etc., which triggers the chronic HP rather than uh, the air coolers themselves. Yeah. We, we have in Maharashtra, wheat butti kind of, you know, where they use the uh, bagus uh, into it. And the bagus has the thermophilic actinomyces. Yeah, so, so who's not the pillar? 
Ah, so that that mm-hmm. is put into that wheat butty. So the moment you move them away from wheat butty, you know the the brick. kills then then the the hp is gone and the lung function improves dramatically so i think sometimes it is that you know repeated history taking and sometimes even the recording or a home visit if you can realistically do it can go a long way in hp antigen removal because that might be the best thing to do rather than the drugs uh the last question nitin, to can i nitin can i take one yeah, minute yeah. so please, just please. just in support of what you are saying i think this is interesting even though it's a different disease process you know i was in um, mumbai last week and doing a meeting and uh, dr nagarjuna maturu was presenting a case live at the session so this was a middle aged guy so he was about 49 50 um who was a, a spice merchant he sells red chilies as a profession and he has a factory where he has red chilies you know and he had severe asthma so this guy would not go away from that factory because that was his livelihood he said on record that there is no way i can actually go away from the trigger and i am sort of saying this because of the chronic hp analogy and there the team gave this patient a biologic even though the trigger was not taken away and oh. the disease control is much better so what i'm trying to say is in support of what you said often you might even identify a trigger but not be able to take it away because able to the do livelihood do. depends on it and they are giving them drugs to try and control it might be the only way forward seem like you can't actually keep away i think a person from here from just coolers and all this so i think you can't uh, ask i think somebody in nagpur not to use cooler <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so um, uh, one more question to you rajesh about uh, echo that was uh, asthma cop or lap and uh, the role of pheno in echo so i think i will i will go for this echo of dinosaurs if i have got a person who is just a relative of 40 years of age has got also reversibility in his spirometry uh, has got some uh, anticipation in the past which was quite at young stage there is some doctor diagnosis of asthma before <clears throat> and uh, if you got blood eosinophils i think maybe between 200 to 300 so so that so that these are the criteria when you say uh, you would be dealing with echo uh, if i won't be using pheno as uh, as you rule out echo that is not the best diagnostic uh, this thing for this thing yeah. but i can just do it just to add add to my diagnosis so yeah. that can be there but but of so the I, I, like I, lender rule out echo by pheno strictly no yeah i think a simple way is you know inflammation yeah, versus bronchoconstriction and the lung damage yeah. and what is reversible and what is not reversible so the yeah. pheno doesn't in any case quantify anything beyond active yeah, inflammation no so i think we have to keep that in mind i think that's 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 where the story lies uh regarding uh, raja one last question to you and then we are going to probably wind up this panel uh, and wonderful session i have thoroughly enjoyed it so lefnunamide in sarcoid is well established somebody has asked about lefnunamide in rilt you use it and uh, i mean so uh, that's an interesting question um so i'll tell you uh, my two penny worth i don't think lefnunamide is ever used in rilt you might want to use it in ra for the joint disease as a second line or a third line agent interestingly if memory serves me right there was a meta analysis which got published in 2014 for leflunomide and the fact that it seemed to cause more ild than methotrexate does so that's yeah. a 2014 meta analysis so mm. the important thing to say rather than talking about whether leflunomide should be given in ra ild the question should be if you are giving leflunomide for ra Think that it might actually result in uh, exactly. ILD. Just, I just, like just like methotrexate. Just like methotrexate. So I Correct. think one has to be very careful there. Yeah. That's a very important thing. So I think with that, uh, uh, I I thank you both and Bhavan for this wonderful panel. And uh, I, I I hand it over to the final remarks if there are any. With that, thank you very much for joining us on this day two, and we look forward to. day three for the last session which is on the next friday the wonderful best of nine napcon that i am enjoying it thoroughly thank you very much thank you thank you nitin bye bye raja thank you